one, two, three, four. Like the fifth or sixth, the 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 fourth, fifth. The fourth, fifth. Yeah, that's. Are we talking music? <laughs> now the seventh. You type in "all's well" as you get some dude, uh, Shakus Peary. Shakus Peary. Um, yeah, "All's well that ends well." Some book he wrote. Some like I don't know. Oh yeah, Peary. there it is. It's oh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Oh, William okay. Shakespeare? <laughs> <laughs> Will I am Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> that was worth the trip. <laughs> but for a second there, I wasn't sure that it was going to pay off, but it did. <laughs> Funny enough, when you search for All's Well, you also just get the other Night Attack. Like, Night Attack 3 is there, Night Attack Live is there, Night Attack 1, and 2. They all, like, show up. That's crazy. Yeah, the, um, it was a real treat seeing the, uh, the iTunes comedy charts light up. The... Uh, and I'm sure uh, I'm, I'm going to latch onto this tagline that Justin forwarded me today. The the honest opinion of somebody who had not ever listened to a single episode of Night Attack was that it was it was like listening to inside jokes, but you know you you don't get it. You know there's a deeper thing to get, but you're still laughing your ass off even though you uh, aren't on the inside, uh, which which I've experienced all the time. That's a that's a, a good thing. Like I have a I have a new book coming out, and the Goodreads reviews are starting to pop up because before it won't they won't show the reviews on Amazon until the book's released. So the Goodreads reviews are popping up, and they they send those books out to anybody who wants to review it, whatever. And so I get a number of reviewers on there who've never read the other books. Right. But the edifying thing is I'm getting a number of people. Like right now it's like a four point six on Goodreads, which is. Great. That's so great. I got my highest rated, my highest rated book so wow. far, which to be number three in the series. But you're, I'm getting people who are like, "Hey, I didn't read the other one, but I'm really, I really enjoy this. Love this. Maybe we helped read the other one, but this is a really good standalone. I really like this." And that's, you know, always sort of a big goal for all of our artists. Like we support our fans, but knowing that somebody might hop on board at any time. Yeah, the exact quote was, the album was absolutely hilarious and felt like ha hearing an inside joke where you simultaneously don't understand completely yet, also laugh your ass off way i feel about most of your comedy guys <laughs> uh yeah no it, it's been uh it's been it's been pretty exciting and we actually have enough now we're really just waiting on the billboard things but uh which i believe drops on now Tuesday. that we could probably do a big like numbers and all in fact I thought this might be actually a good after things topic mm -hmm. of whether or not we should do a big like hey what does it take to get into the top five of the iTunes charts? Like, yeah. because uh, uh, the numbers might surprise you <laughs> looking at what they are uh, now that we have uh, data from iTunes through CD Baby. Well, and also, like, you know, that big push started in the morning, which meant that there was momentum going through the rest of the day when all those charts were busier. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. but like, we can we can pretty much track it through when it goes live at midnight Eastern time on Monday night into Tuesday morning through Wednesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Nice. Yeah. I think, uh, I, it looks like billboard drops the album charts on Tuesdays. So we, uh, should know of that tomorrow, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh which, that's really the only the only thing that that can still go wrong with this is is that. <laughs> oh, there's plenty more. I mean, copyright infringement, royalty rights fights. I guess uh, yeah, we have people's we have ears bleeding when they listen to it. Yeah. We actually actually no, that that's not true. We we did get some uh, we did get some confusion on like crediting. Uh, yeah, it looked like on Google it only it listed. I only saw it under your name, Justin. Maybe they, mm. maybe it's right. But weird. I know there's, there's weird stuff when it comes to like, um, ands for artist names. Oh, really? I hadn't even seen that. No, mm, it, it was... of course not. Guy says who lives in your Mountain View. Oh, mm. Well, and it could, it could be that it was. I mean, there were also people who were like, I bought it on Google, and then in my Google library, it wasn't the right order of the tracks, and then. Oh really? They like they came back and it would be fixed. So like I think Google's just kind of fucking up. That's weird. I mean, here's all I Screw know up. is that we is that did our the plan album. worked. <laughs> uh, uh, we did the album, and I wanted to put 
everything that cogs all the songs as like kind of looking at this in the same way that that you know uh, uptown funk isn't a bruno mars song right it's like it's like a mark ronson song featuring bruno mars because it was on a mark ronson album despite right. the fact that it's fairly obviously the reason why it's awesome is because of bruno mars so i wanted to put featuring cogswell and all of it and cd baby in their input thing would not let me it was like mm. hey if you want to give credit and you want to show features then you need to do it in the featuring like uh thing and so when you list each track right and now i didn't push it i could have just probably tried to do it again or not put parentheticals and just wrote it a different way or something uh but i figured okay well i'll just list it in the thing and maybe that's how i don't know how the featuring somebody gets there like mm -hmm. uh, uh i don't know if it's if you just write it like you you'd normally do or if i'm going to write it as featuring stephen cogswell and then i list stephen cogswell as the music music by in the track whether it's going to be featuring stephen cogswell featuring stephen cogswell and the way that you make those albums it's like they're very clear make sure everything that you want is perfect because once it goes out into the world there's 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 no tearing it back right. like it's it, it, it's a it's a major pain in the ass uh so i listed cogswell as, as for all for the music except for uh, for all the balls deep i, I fucked up on that mm -hmm. but everything else has cogswell listed is there but it's like on none of the tracks it's not like because i wanted it as like featuring bonnie brushwood featuring uh you know <laughs> I, I really wanted uh uh, what's it called? The uh, uh, need a little time to be like featuring Callie Brushwick. I think it would be really funny to have a five year old with like listed credit. Yeah. So for anybody asking about why there's like not, we got a few, I got a few of those tweets of like, why isn't Cogswell listed in the like official crediting of the album? It's like, did, did what I could uh, yeah. uh, uh, in, in, in doing it. Uh, I, I don't know how it, it then gets interpolated through iTunes, through Amazon, through Google Play, through the the mobile versions versus the desktop versions. Yeah, uh, you know I all the with. Oh no, go ahead. I was yeah, I was to say that you know when I I did a, I wrote a short story for the Predator anthology if it bleeds, and on Amazon sometimes if you do it, it they changed it. First you do a search, sometimes my name would come up first. But I'm no, I wasn't listed. Now, if you see the first two authors, the like the guy who you know produced the series, Brian Spencer, who we've talked to and all that, and, and uh, then Jeremy Robinson, then I'm like third, even in like anonymous searches or whatever. Um, even though in sci-fi, I'm not a big name. You got Lord Larry Correa, Jonathan Mayberry, and all that. But I think overall on Amazon, because I sell so many thrillers, Amazon puts that name pushes my name towards the front. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know, my dudes. It's uh, it, it's it, it's a weird system. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, so far it looks like everything is going according to Hoyle, and uh, we uh, we will hopefully tomorrow have a, a billboard celebration. And if not, we will have a very important lesson to no matter what anybody tells you, list your albums at three dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, anything? Uh, I think I'm good to go. Are you guys ready? You good, Andrew? I am getting ready to tweet this out. Oh, okay. um, sure. You want to go live right now, or we, we are we live. are live. We even what? Live. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just tweet this out right now. Sure. Uh, yeah, the, the all the um, distributors kind of handle crediting and stuff differently. I use um, a DistroKid, which is very like very close more more self-service right it's not a you don't really get any support for it but it's a lot cheaper yeah. um and uh um they theirs is also just like here's a field if you put anything in this field if you don't put anything in this field we'll use the credited artist but if you are going to do a feature then you have to do it it in a certain way and you have to have very specific formatting um but for act names, but it's uh, it, so much of all of the technical infrastructure of, of the digital music industry is just a lot of duct tape, you know, um, it is, it is, it, it, it's one, one, of, one of my favorite metaphors is, uh, uh, designing software for ATM machines, uh, mm -hmm. uh, where it's like something that's very, very important to people, oftentimes vital. 
and yet you have no control over where the buttons are going to go or which ones are going to break. And, and that's why it's like, you'll, you'll often be at a ATM, not the newer ones that have like from the banks, but like your average bodega ATM, mm. uh, they'll be like, yes, will be like the thing, but the, the button closest, will be between like two a items. half inch up. Yeah. And so that's what I felt a lot of going through the process of, of publishing the album through CD baby is like, mm-hmm. they're doing like they're trying to find the middle, uh, the middle of the road of like what all these services need or want or fields that they can then replicate into exactly how all this metadata yeah. propagates. If, uh, so, if, if you want to see a, a Byzantine system, uh, check out the um, publisher, um, uh, the, the the PROs like BMI or ASCAP. Their their system for inputting songs is is equally like dated. Um, yeah. But those the infrastructure on that like hasn't changed, and partially because it's very difficult to change um, for for you know so much existing data. Um, but it's a lot of like okay, you know. Every song has to have a a, a one hundred point zero percent claiming for like writing, and you can input all of the publish, uh, you know, all of the writing credits and all of the exact percentage to like three decimal pl- places, because you know, for especially for big name contracts, that stuff is uh, is important. But it's all it, you look at it, and, and there's no glamour at it or or modern elements to it at all. Yeah. Weird, 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 weird. Weird things. All right. You guys uh, guys good to go? Indeed. Let's go. All right, then. Take it away, Andrew, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yo! Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. And Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. It's it's me. Gentlemen. I have uh, gathered the council to whoa, discuss whoa. important matters. Oh, thank okay. goodness. Good. Matters of weirdness. Such as? Name one weird thing. Yeah, right. and uh, I'm, I'm tired of hearing all these things that are less weird than I would prefer. Well, I'll give you a, a weird thing about a weird thing. Um, remember our talk about Planet Nine? You know, Planet Nine's this... Maybe something that's like you know up to like ten times the mass of Earth at the outer edges of our solar system. We call it Planet Nine because some killjoys demoted Pluto, you know, to <laughs> dwarf planet. So then, we're like, well, now we got this empty slot. And then, so uh, uh, my, I think it's Michael Brown and uh, Constantine Batigin. I may be pronouncing the names incorrectly. Caltech noticed there was a pattern in outer objects of the outer, outer edge of the solar system, like I think like Kuiper belt objects, et cetera, or Oort cloud, and noticed that like, man, it's like something's pulling on them. And they did the math and they said, you know what? It looks like there could be a massive planet way out the outer edge of our solar system, right? And this is, if you go look at the astronomical data, it's very compelling. It's very, very compelling. And for the longest time, they're like, hey, there's this anomaly. You know, just random noise doesn't seem to explain why these objects are being pulled in this one particular direction. And finally, somebody's come up with a suggestion other than there being a planet. Oh, that's wild. Uh, I mean, what else could it be? Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, I got our, nothing. A black hole? Our, our chat room's going, spiders? It's always <laughs> spiders. <laughs> I mean, listen, no matter what, you always find a way to bring a bag there. So, uh, yeah, this is a pretty long loop, but uh, I got a, I got a suspicion <laughs> with them you're going to figure out a way to put egg, eight, eight legs or fangs on this some bitch. Uh, actually, some researchers are suggesting, oh, maybe it's a ring. A ring of debris could possibly explain it. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. So uh, uh, this would all be uh, stuff that we would never see on a telescope, right? Um, uh, debris or well, dust? Well, it, it may be if you know exactly where to look and you're able to notice some sort of occlusion or something like that. But it would take, uh, it would take something like a, a Kepler-level uh, dedicated satellite to try to spot that to see yeah, you know, just like those right exact now moments. Trying, they're trying to use the, the Subaru telescope in Hawaii to, to spot Planet Nine. Um, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting read. It's a, it's a theory I'm still leaning towards. It's a planetary body because the researchers are like, Hey, it's great that there's an alternative theory out there. Here's the problem we have. Why would that ring stay formed like that out there? How did it form, et cetera? 
and it's it's an alternative explanation, but it's an even from their point of view, the physics of it even more complicated than just saying, yeah, there's a planet out there. Um, but, so I, I I guess uh it would be, um. I mean, first of all, like an answer either way would be exciting, full stop. But it's not like we're going to go visit Planet Nine. And now it's like, it's not like uh, we're halfway to Hawaii. We found out like, sorry, kids, there is no Hawaii. Turns out it's just an archipelago of, of, of a billion tiny islands. Um, well, like, just, Brian, just. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean, like, like emotionally, it's, uh, uh, I guess it doesn't change uh, any any excitement to solve the mystery. Uh, well, you're clearly not a Caltech astronomer. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hear your point, but like, if you go back to the the image Bryce put up there, you know, the thing that it, that I think is exciting is that the more we realize that our solar system's not just this flat sort of you have nine objects and that's the end of it, where we realize like, no, it's way bigger. That that and I, the archipelago idea, I like that because it means if you want to expand outward into the universe going from here to Mars to, you know, Europa. Oh, and that's interesting for... because because a giant supermassive gas uh, rogue planet would be, I mean, maybe useful to orbit around if you wanted to set up a, a space station over there. But if it's all debris, uh, let's say a bunch of Manhattan-sized, um, you know, uh, 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 asteroids, then uh, that's pretty useful. That's a lot of that's a lot of easy to access minerals and and things to hollow out and make a, a place well, for for our biological infection to spread. If there's a planet out there, odds are more than likely based on what we know, it has moons. Oh. And some of those moons could be big moons. Even Pluto, you know, has orbits with an object. You know, the only planet in our system that doesn't have a moon is Venus. Or excuse me, Mercury rather, or Mercury and Venus rather. Uh, Mercury and Venus don't have, but other than that, the further out you go, you you like the 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 uh, astronometric uh, optimist. Uh, like no matter what, you've got good news. <laughs> I'm just saying, just saying. You know, Mr. Jeff Bezos wants to have you know millions of people living and working in space. They gotta live somewhere. Yeah. Or just floating in space. I don't know. We need to ask him. He needs to clarify that for us. <laughs> yeah, somebody get him on the horn. Jeff, uh, you got a lot of explaining to do. Uh, now, in uh, another interesting development, remember we talked about uh, last year, Swarm Technologies, they had uh, wanted to launch uh, like a little constellation of satellites, right? And they went to the FCC. They're like, hey, uh, we want to launch a little constellation of satellites. And the response was like, hey, uh, no, um, this is, uh, we don't, not sure if you're able to track these. We have a problem with this. You cannot do it. Swarm's like, oh, oh, okay, all right, cool, it's all right. And then they went, they had a launch set out with an Indian company, and they basically used maybe a subsidiary or something to that effect and launched them anyways. And then the FCC is like, man, there's a lot of communications going between this company in America and these satellites. Like, is it you, Swarm Technologies? It's like, uh oh. Um, so they got caught and they got fined. For 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 launching like have they already launched these? Are they still want to? Or they, they got like half No, they launched them. They were up in space. That was the problem. They went ahead and launched them anyways. Wow. They were denied the permit from the FCC, but Swarm went ahead and basically they used uh an unaffiliated company in India to get around the restrictions but was caught when the satellites trans transmitted to a station in uh, back in the U.S. Wow. And so the issue here is that they, would it have been a different story if they had just totally decamped and, and were operating out of uh, uh, India? Yeah, I mean, if they weren't an American-based company, then it would be a different situation, but they're still an American-based company, so they are beholden to American laws applying to these things. So, so they tried to have their cake and eat it too. They, 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 they got yeah. a no from the U.S. government, and so they contracted through a subsidiary to do it in India. But uh, I guess hoping that uh, eventually the the mood would change in the FCC. Um, yeah, I think they're maybe. Let's see, if we can get away with you know because I think they had a lot of venture capital invested in it. They were at a point where they're they needed to get this thing done, and all of a sudden the FCC is like no, and. 
Uh, and perhaps for very good reasons, we don't know. I mean, I, I don't know the particulars of it, but it is a very interesting, you know, we've talked about kind of the maverick age of space, you know, space now. I got to be honest, I'm I'm impressed that any U.S. government institution would would even have that much ability to, you know, to cause trouble. I guess the fact that they're, you know, based in America gives some leverage and it should have been obvious. But uh, but I mean, I'm impressed they were able to even find them a million dollars and get some kind of uh, uh, a I don't know, acknowledgement of authority in that regard. Mm -hmm. Well, what, you know, this, the question begs some people are like, well, was the fine too low? It was $900,000. It's not crippling for swarm technologies. Well, um, I, I think some argue you probably wouldn't, be. even a bad actor, even a naughty boy uh, can be, you know, they, they want to correct them, not destroy them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's that's hopefully that yeah that is hopefully the direction that's going into because I, I think what Swarm is working on is very interesting and it's there is that we see that in a lot of disruptive companies like Airbnb and Uber and whatnot where there's and it's where is the line between hey government is being us unnecessarily intruding what we're trying to do or no government's doing what it's supposed to do you guys don't know what you're doing or you guys are taking risks you shouldn't be taking and so um. Yeah, the point is that uh, we just saw a graph there. They were able to raise $25 million after the FCC fine. And so the idea is that, hey, we paid our fine, we learned our lesson, and now we've raised $25 million in funding. Well, because now they're the industry leader, right? <laughs> like like they, they did the thing that was technically illegal. They, they eat the million-dollar fine, but after they get right with uh, Uncle Sam – they're still the guys that did the thing in a, in a world where nobody else did the thing. How on earth yeah. do you keep that quiet uh, to your investors? To like, like, like uh, ostensibly, you're a company that, that does a thing. Do you tell your investors, like, everything's fine, uh, on schedule, the things are up in the sky? You know, it, it's a great question. And, and it may be a, you know, they looked at it and said, let's, what are the risks of doing this? And they're like, yeah, we know that the record fine fine we've seen for this is a million dollars and they're going to want to follow you more closely. And they might be like, okay. Or it might be that they're like, hey, we're going to use this Indian company, the subsidiary or the launch company there. So we're technically going to say we're not responsible for it and hope that maybe we loophole our way through it. And then it failed. And they're like, wah, wah. Yeah. I, look, I, I think that, that for them, it's kind of a win win. Like either. They continue to get this experience by, and it's for whatever reason, a hole in the sheet legal, right? Or, you know, I guess they were at the mercy of a much larger fine or something that would, you know, uh, you know, preventative actions being taken from the FCC that would prevent them from operating in the future. But short of that, they pay the fine and, and they and they are now, you know, uh, uh, publicly certified by the government to be doing a thing that is very, very, very valuable that could be you know, a, a, a microwaved uh, telecommunications company or even the backbone that you could sell, you know, to to telecoms uh, that, that want to lease it. So it, that is that is a gigantic uh, possible market. So it's a, a I don't know. I mean, I think that you have uh, Andrew's point earlier about there is a new level of venture capitalism that understands with the runaway success of of companies like uber and airbnb that this you know innovation that requires you paying fines isn't quite the the deal breaker that it might have been in the past you know when when you know mark mark cuban likes to tell a story about how his greatest investment a uh, missed investment was uber uh because he had previously uh, invested in a travis uh, kalanick company and uh, mark cuban's point was like ah it's just gonna take you're, you're going to be hung up in red tape uh, getting these licenses city by city forever. It's just going to you're going to burn through all your money, not realizing that, oh, no, you just run and you wait for them to shut you down. And then immediately you have all the press you need and you have the righteous anger of people that are annoyed that they can't get a cheaper ride from here to there. So for this, it, it, I think, you know, this is a much larger example. Now you're dealing with the federal government. And uh, there are a lot of agencies that have dominion over space that you probably would not necessarily want to cross in the same way that you would, let's say, the local government of the city of Miami. But at the end of the day, it's uh, you know it seems like it worked out for them. They wound up raising twenty five million after this press release. Yeah. So um, it's 
just I bring it up as, hey, we're 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 moving into this era where people are going to be able to do move fast, break things, and the fear is, you know, we don't want people to break things that can't be unbroken. Yeah, I, I guess that's the, um, you know, it sounds like this was a lucky best case scenario for a Swarm, uh, right down to the fact that they, you know, deployed the whatever. But uh, man, oh man, uh, things could have gone a different way. My guess is there was a probably a legitimate reason why the FCC denied them <laughs> permission. Yeah, I mean, you get into the FCC's concern is the ability to track these objects. You know, like, can you track where you put these things up there? And that's one of the concerns now, some of the smaller, you know, CubeSats is that you put these things up there, and if you lose track of them, they can be a hazard. And generally, CubeSats are designed now, or most of the orbits you can do are you're supposed to basically in 30 days collapse, you know, into, uh, you know, the Earth's atmosphere. So that's generally sort of the goal there, but that's not the case for everything. Um, so. Fun times. You know what else is fun? Doing this show. Hey, yeah, yeah. man. Uh, 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 Justin Young here to tell you about Patreon.com slash Weird Things. Yes, I said Patreon.com slash Weird Things. Uh, folks, we like to do it the old-fashioned way, by you giving us money over the Internet. And we do that with the good folks at Patreon. You know, if you go ahead on over to your family's computer and enter in patreon.com slash weird things into a web browser, you're going to be able to support this show. And and what does that mean? Uh, Brian, uh, what does uh, the support of uh, America and the world mean to you? I mean, it's worth approximately 35 trillion cubits of latinum. It's uh, the most valuable thing I can possibly imagine. So while you may only be giving a dollar per episode, know that emotion, in emotional terms, uh, you are the richest person in the planet. Yes. Be the richest person on the planet by going to patreon.com slash weird things. <laughs> uh, disclaimer, rich means rich in spirit and not in money. <laughs> Because technically you'll be less wealthy for you'll having be given less us... wealthy yeah. in money, more wealthy in spirit by going to patreon.com slash weird things, supporting this show and also getting early access to after things. Our show we do after weird things where we talk about business and creation and everything in between. Speaking of everything in between, um, I have another story for you here, gentlemen. Question. All right, go. So uh, a friend of mine who uh, – actually, I'm going to go speak at his class uh, in a couple hours, um, which I doubt any of them are listening to it because it's supposed to be a little surprise. Uh, his name is Paul Hynek, and his father was Dr. J. Allen Hynek, and there's now a TV show on History Channel, Project Blue Book, starring Aidan Gillen from Game of Thrones. Oh, you heard wow. about the show? Uh, no, I've not seen the show, but uh, but I am familiar with Project Blue Book, uh, the um, uh, the the big chasing UFO stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, now this all, show, all I know about this show is uh, uh, seeing your Instagram and the awesome photo booth they set up at the premiere. Oh yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, so what's interesting is that uh, the show basically takes some of the more sensational sort of stories and then spins them off into their own kind of narrative. So it's not a fact-based, this is what happened. It's like, hey, let's take this and sort of do a what-if kind of story about this. And, you know, it, what's interesting is every time UFO conversations come up, and, and I actually I went to the uh, one of the premiere parties for this, and I got to talk to the guy who's head of MUFON, which is the you know one of the UFO research groups and some other nice people. And, you know, I, I come from a uh, more skeptically inclined background, we'll put it this way. And, 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 you know, my, my mindset on these things is that when I think we probably all share this is that we're really bad at recognizing what we're very good at constructing narratives about what we see. We're very bad at reconstructing what we saw precisely. And, yes. you know, so, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, somebody says, oh, they saw a UFO. I'm not going to call it a liar. You know, I, you know, I'll tell you what I did at the supermarket yesterday. It's probably a lie because, you know, I didn't go down that aisle or I got that the week before, whatever. So it, it's interesting, though, because I've had a numerous times where I've had conversations with people who I would consider extremely sincere and extremely credible. At one point I talked to a couple of years ago, uh, had a driver in a car who actually used to be an Air Force pilot. He used to fly escort for SR-71s. And this guy had 
fascinating stories about like them, you know, intercepting objects, like being, you know, told that there is things at a hundred thousand feet, which, you know, they couldn't go attack, but, you know, basically saying that there was like told to intercept objects, things like this, that behave strangely, whatever you talk to pilots and you hear crazy, weird stories. So my question is, is there maybe something out there? Uh, define define something <laughs> like something uh, could be, be that that uh my my rationale my my belief is that there are phenomenon that we recognize some that we don't there's all sorts of interesting upper atmospheric phenomena we're just beginning to understand as far as the way you know particular kinds of lighting effects things like this you get things called trolls and plasma effects etc things like this but you know what what are your what is your when you talk to ufo people and a lot of them aren't really like they're not not all of them are like, oh, it's aliens. A lot of them are like, oh, it's interdimensional. You know, oh, it's this. I see what you know, you're putting up. Look, we get it. Finally, you're landing it, and you're going to reveal that it's spiders. It's spiders, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, man, I, I got to tell you, I'm I'm utterly predisposed. I, I've spent so much time learning about what flawed wetware human beings are, and and I hold very very little um, uh, account for stories. I, I hold uh, very mm -hmm. little value. Uh, in, in the eyewitness tales, I, I, and again, it's not that anybody's out to get you or that you have to complain, oh, you're calling me a liar. It's like, no, 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 you can believe something and, and not be lying when you tell it. And then, and plus also, you know, if you could point to, um, anomalous, uh, either recordings or, uh, whether it be of, you know, visual phenomenon or, or instrument recordings or whatever, it's already an acknowledged fact that instruments you know stuff happens and there are a lot of really interesting um genuine phenomenon that that happen that get recorded and they show up at first as anomalies and then we figure out what happens stuff like you know solar flares and so on uh but but in general uh, man i just i just go to uh, there, there's a lot of gravitational weight around that Occam's razor of of when you know that there's a 99.99 percent chance that nobody's remembering the story correctly. Then, then that's it's really hard to escape from that gravity well to to go to uh, uh, the planet extraordinary for for me. Uh, but again, that's that's my bias because I just tend to look at the human side of things. Uh. Yeah, I, I I tend to, I mean, like, are are there things out there? Sure. Let's say that there are things out there. I don't know how uh, how much uh, I'm I'm into the idea. The the further we get, for a, a the older I get, and the further we get into our 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 modern technological world, the more I think the archetype of the like coquettish shy alien that just wants to like pick off the uh the, the 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 fringes of our herd is kind of a myth of the analog era uh, uh of, of of a bygone era where so much more was you know even compared the 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 70s let alone the 50s or the 40s to now uh and and understand how much of our world was recorded through oral tradition uh, even in broadcasting and mass media, uh, I, I, I tend to think that that seems more and more convenient the further that we that we get out. So I think the the the, the expeditionary alien that we understand, I think, seems a little sillier and sillier as days go by. But as for what's out in the great beyond, I mean, oh, anything's who, on the table, yeah. But the uh, I, I was really struck by. Uh, I, I like where your head's at in terms of, you know, the deeper into the Cold War era you go, uh, the more humans are involved at all points in the system and the less fidelity we have and the more we rely on memories and storytelling. I was really struck watching First Man that 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 like pilots nowadays send someone up in a spaceship, a pilot's there, I guess, just in case something goes wrong. But uh, but back then, like pilot was the only way to do it you had to have a pilot correct the the spinning around well, and, and and landing yeah, and aiming yeah. and all that stuff first man which i did really enjoy i was i was sad to see it not get uh award recognition but uh man if there is an uh if there is a monument to show how much of a science fair experiment our our initial trip to mars was in our entire proto space 
program. Uh, 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 you you owe it to yourself to go see it just to watch every rickety bucket of bolts uh, uh, go up and creak and uh, uh, the, the the brave men that, that figured that out. I uh, you know I bring this up because I want to be guarded on my own skepticism and and I you know I think we we all sort of feel the same way that. We see so much of how easy it is for people to misinterpret things. As people in magic, we watched, we do something one day, and a week later, people regale us with an ex- with something they saw that we know is not what they saw. Or, My or, or own even experience, even describing the exact trick that you know, I know how I did it, and what you're describing is not possible. <laughs> but uh... yeah, and you know, and and you know, using you know my own example, I, I look for my own examples of where I failed to be a good observer and. I think I'm a good observer. I think overall I'm a pretty – I try to be an accurate observer, but I know I fail. And so using my own self is sort of a test going like, hey, I make these mistakes all the time. I have to assume you know, other people I speak to, and often people I find the more extreme the thing they observed, I would say that other observations in their life imply they're not the most credible observers. Uh, but you don't want to discount somebody and say, oh, no, but I think that – it would seem that there would be so much more evidence. That's the thing it comes down to is there just be so much more evidence for these things. Well, and uh, that's the, I think it was Steven Spielberg. And we've mentioned this on the show before, but uh, back when he was doing press junkets and tours for uh, when he redid war of the worlds, uh, his position on UFOs had changed because during um, close encounters of the third kind, he was like, yeah, I believe it. I'm for it. I, I think it's a thing. And then war of the worlds, he's like, well, the number of cameras has increased, uh, like geometrically, exponentially, by by factors of a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, and yet the number of reported uh, uh, photos, uh, uh, like also, uh, you know, algorithmically going down. And so it seems like if there was something out there, the clearer your vision, the better you would be able to see it, not the reverse. And that that's the uh, that's that's a uh, a frustrating thing to get around. Yeah, you know, you go pick up one of the old like UFO guides or from the 1970s or 80s and the different photos and illustrations people did of 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 a lot of the a lot of the majority of the ones you look in there and you go, "All right, if you ever live near an airport or stand near a place where you see planes take off and you look at all the different angles of which you see planes and you start looking at this you're like plane 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 plane." Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, "Man, yeah, oh, let's yeah, we saw this long silver streak with these windows <laughs> and a red and a blue light." Ah, oh, god, I wonder you know, because well, and also if you've way. if you've ever seen a, a plane aiming like headed right towards you coming into a to approach, it looks like the classic stereotypical flying saucer. Mm-hmm. It is a straight line with a little bulbous part in the middle, and same thing for um that that fuselage, especially like American Airlines where it's all silver. That thing catches the the sun at sunset. Yep. It is just this 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 beam of light frozen in place. It's 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 remarkable. Yeah, and it's. I remember watching. I was in Santa Monica uh, with our friend Mary. We're walking along. Uh, we're pre-production for some show, and we look out there and we see these lights way beyond the ocean, just hovering, hovering, hovering. And I'm like, that's. I'm like, let's watch. This is fascinating because, like, I'm like, what is that? Because it looked like I'm thinking a helicopter. But it couldn't be. It was. I think it was a helicopter that far out to sea, and we waited. And it took like 15 minutes, and finally we saw once it curved in for LAX, it was an airplane. But from the direction we're at, it looked like this massive body hovering. Because, and the same effect that like why the moon looks bigger, depending on what part of the sky it is relating to buildings, we're getting that same effect where this thing looked huge. You right. know, and you know that's you know anyhow, uh, we're willing to be shown. We're willing to be shown. But uh, I sent Bryce a link to it's kind of cool sprite lightning, which is a very cool you know effect where you look at some of these examples of. Uh, some of it just looks like glowing, but like the top one is pretty cool. Uh, the the red one. Wow. You know, uh, okay, you know. so it looks like um, it looks like uh, man. According to this uh, this scale, although it would be difficult to really know how far it goes, but 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 this looks like kind of a, a ghostly jellyfish or mushroom cloud, mm-hmm. a gaseous anomaly, twenty kilometers tall. Is that right? Uh, upper atmosphere, so yeah, it could be that tall. You know, these things can stretch all the way from the you know the, the thermosphere to the stratosphere. And do they do they hang around for uh, for for a long time, or about as long as a lightning strike, or or what? I think they're just about as long as a lightning strike. Okay. But you know, we know we get some other phenomena that last a little bit longer. 
Uh, and there's there's a lot of like upper atmospheric stuff just fascinates me because it's just a lot we don't know. You know, we're, we're very good at studying what happens with, you know, 30,000 feet or so because that's where airplanes are. But if you look at some of the images they have are like from uh, uh, they show a sprite over Laos, one of the, the third image down or fourth image down taken from the International Space Station. And you look at when you're looking down at this these objects, which would be awesome if we had more ways to observe and to see these things. Yeah. So you see the oh lightning gosh, and the yeah, sprite right the above sprite. there. Wow. Oh, wow. So, so the sprite, like, yeah, looks like it's this reddish jellyfish sort of thing that appears for momentary during the lightning thing. And and that's, you know, there's some speculation about, you know, is lightning, do we fully understand how it's caused? Because is, it, is there a trigger? Can it be triggered by uh, cosmic rays? Are there other effects to it? Is it just simply what we think of like, you know, an electrostatic differences or does it need a trigger or can it be triggered, etc.? So visually, this thing looks like a picture, picture a disk of, of clouds, right? Uh, and then um, imagine lightning striking in the middle. And as if, uh, if you've ever seen the visual of, of, of ejecta from a black hole, you know, uh, uh, it, it looks like plasma shooting out of a black hole above a lightning strike. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. What is uh? Oh. People in the chat room are talking about ball lightning. Um, I did we ever get a definitive answer on what that is? Uh... So we've we've been able to recreate ball lightning uh, in the laboratory. Well, what is and... the description of it? Because I've heard so many wildly different descriptions. Well, it might be a variety of phenomenon, but basically, you're talking about a small or a large ball shaped uh, energy of like plasma. Okay. So you get something that gets, you know, some people say, you know, bits of dust or something gets superheated into a plasma and it's cohesive for a few seconds. It can bounce around, et cetera. So that seems to be, you know, as far as what we think that is. So how it's caused, we can create in the, you know, we can create it, you know, I said we can create it in the lab uh, or something that, appear, you know, seems to have the same effect. But what's been observed in, you know, out in nature Maybe that same thing. It may be, you know, high electrical discharge, you know, turning something into a plasma that. Ooh, an, another good question. What what is a Saint? What is Saint Elmo's fire? Uh, Saint Elmo's fire was the uh, when ships were at sea and they would see the electrical discharge at the top of the mass. So basically, it's like your ship or whatever to be like acting kind of like a Van de Graaff generator. Oh yeah, yeah, because because everything's uh, supercharged like right before a storm or something like that. Yeah, I uh, that's what Saint Elmo's fire was. And, everything's you know, crackling. An iconic movie of the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's look at yeah, but remember Saint. And I, that's you know, it's all these different sort of, you know, phenomenon. You know, which are uh, so yeah, a coronal discharge from a sharper pointed object. And so the example this shows a ship at sea and it be discharged off the top. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so, um, so basically imagine um, uh, the boat is you shuffling your feet across shag carpet, mm -hmm. only you have uh, spindly metal fingers, and out of them is, is you know, zapping, yeah, like like uh, like in the background of a monster horror movie from the 1950s, yeah. sort of <laughs> just, just electricity tendrils. Yeah, between that and you think about, uh, you know, there are certain times, there have been periodic times where the aurora borealis has been visible much more in lower altitude or, or lower latitudes. Uh, you know, that's been kind of an interesting phenomenon. Then you talk about like at night where you could see, um, you know, uh, the uh, glowing plankton and et cetera. And you get, you know, all these sorts of things. It's we sort of forget all the luminous things around us. The, uh, I, I told this story, must have been five years ago, I think, but my friend um, C.J. Johnson called me uh, and he was like, all right, look, as uh, you're my resident skeptic, I need you to talk me through what I'm seeing because I'm looking at a a light in the sky that is so much brighter than Aliens. any stars. And I'm seeing it, I'm watching it right now over my house move up and down and left and right. Uh, it, it'll stay in place for a while and then move again. And then, uh, and uh, through a series of questions, um, uh, I reminded him that like, okay, well, you know, a lot of those mystery spots where water seems to go uphill, they work because there's been a landslide and all the trees have kind of tilted or shifted 
As a result, because you unconsciously use those trees as a frame of reference, now it looks like the water is going up because all the trees are kind of tilted off to the side. Likewise, an object that is static in the sky can appear to move if you're looking at it between a canopy of trees because you, you know, let's say all the tree, there's no wind and then the trees are all still and then there's a slight wind you're on whether you know it or not you're using those leaves and branches as a frame of reference so as they sway gently back left right up down or whatever it's going to make it look like the bright light goes up and down and then I was and I was like okay let's talk about the the, the light is it a point of light or can you uh, detect it as, as as a disc or what have you and he was like no 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 it's a point of light and uh, it was fun because this is all pre-internet before, or I guess not pre-internet, but early internet where it was not easy to just uh, pull open a web browser and find this. But I happen to have the Starry Night software on my laptop at the time. This is what, 15 years ago? And, uh, and, I, and I fired it up and I went to his location and I looked up and exactly where he was describing, I was like, good news, you've discovered Jupiter. You're looking at ah! Jupiter. <laughs> But I'm sure but I'm sure it was it was an electrifying experience. And I think that's part of the attraction, Uh, you know, in a pre-Internet days, let's say let's say post campfire, but pre-Internet. I think there's something that we all want with a good ghost story, with a good tickling of the senses, something to give you goosebumps and make you wonder, you know, what's out there, uh, the, the, the mysterious and the unknown. And I remember watching all of those, you know, in search of any special that had UFOs or ghosts or any of that stuff. Uh, I think there, that's a that's a universal need of humanity. And in a post-internet days, days, it's interesting to see that bubble up in different ways because even if you're a skeptic, you 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 know dive into like creepy pastas and and these stories of like there's no way to know. Like we want them to be in Schrodinger's uh, box so that we can't ever know if they're true or not. But, but we get that, that delightful goose flesh from, from hearing those stories. Yeah. It's, it's harder now. I don't know to, to be uh, a sincerely open-minded critical thinker and accept a lot of these things in my opinion. And I may be being offending a lot of people. And I apologize. When I was a kid, I wanted to know about UFOs and ghosts. I went to the library, and most of the books written on ghosts and UFOs were written by people who, guess what, said they were real because that's who bought most of those books. And you'd read about these yeah. accounts, and you're like, I have no way to refute this. Like, I guess, you know, somebody says this. And then in the age of the Internet, the skeptical voice and people who are saying, well, here's the thing. When they say this house was haunted, whatever, what they failed to mention was, you know, there was a teenage son there who had been arrested for blah, 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 you know, or this goat, this UFO story. Uh, this photo that you saw there was actually airbrushed in. We know this. Or this guy who saw these UFOs, they found a barn where he had a bunch of UFO models, you know. And you you, you get these other, and you realize, like, now that extends to sort of documentary television and stuff, too, where you watch stuff and you're like, oh, I know people involved in this. This was a lie, you know. But, yeah, I think it's easier. I, I kind of figured out that kind of as a skeptic, we sort of won when the World Wide Web came about because if you want to find out, you can find out. You can find out what intelligent people have to say about it. Although nowadays, uh, you know, it's interesting because there there was a time when, um, we'll say right around and before the turn of the century, when uh, there was people getting the word out about pseudoscience, um, about like, hey, this is flawed for this reasons. Here's what you don't know, this research or whatever. And then there was the, you know, the Snopes era of being able to Google things and, and get a skeptical take instantly. And now it's interesting. It seems like we're in a post uh, capital T truth era. And, and now where it's like, uh, it's like, no, 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 I want to believe they're aliens. I don't want to hear or see anything that tells me otherwise. Let me just uh, like the appropriate things. And uh, yay, now I live in a world where that's that's a fact and that's the end of it. <laughs> Well, I, I think that there is there is that that element of our of our curiosity, but there's also that desire for the story, right? There's there's there, there there's there's that desire to understand, like, okay, well, who are these people? How are they reacting to it? Like, what happens after the alien shows up? These are these kind of like great sort of like storytelling tropes that we can sort of digest in a different way in bite sized formats. There's also like the if you spent a large part of your life 
embracing an idea that's non-conventional or unconventional that other people don't accept and telling people this and having people call you, well, that's a little nutty. I don't think that's real, whatever. You're really invested in not losing your faith in that. You know, you you stand because you if you find out all of a sudden like, oh, no, uh, yeah, that guy who you claimed that evidence was real, we found out was a hoax. You don't really want to, you know, like you're you're. You know, nobody wants to find out that, you know, the comic book man, oh, my God, I wasted my life, you know, <laughs> and that's, you know, I, I guess it's part of it. Like I and I try to be sympathetic towards that because, like, I've gone, you know, we go to some of these groups and talk to people who believe ardently in you know UFOs and Bigfoot and stuff. And it's like there is no room in their worldview that they could be wrong. And that's the thing that I find I'm I'm willing to accept that I could be wrong. I'm love to find bigfoot love to find this ufo stuff yeah i think that that's the thing we're 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 would be pumped like yeah like if anything we're trying to pre-disappoint ourselves for how excited we would be if some of this stuff were where we could find proof of it yeah well anyhow we do picks yeah man Uh, yeah i got a pick so well i I don't know which one i want to do here which one i want to do in after uh, after things but i watched all but the final episode, what I think is the final episode, because Hulu's system is so weird, of the second season of Future Man. Oh, shoot. Uh, cool. How is it? Uh, man, does it get off to a slow start. Oh. Uh, uh, I, was, I was kind of ready to tap out on it uh, uh, four or five episodes in. Uh, and then it kind of gets back to what I, I think its its strength is, which is uh, the 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 team being together, uh, uh, going through a complicated, uh, at times over complicated, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy that involves time travel. You know, that's that I think is when it is clicking, uh, and even when the the, the satire that it wants to bring to the science fiction genre, uh, you know, is kind of brought to the fore. And uh, at times it gets a little bit too wackety schmackety, like, look, this is like that other movie. Uh, and I think it's when it gets away from the fact that we really like these characters and we want to see these characters kind of evolve and and uh, uh, play off each other and, you know, come come together and turn apart and, do all that. So it, it, it gets to there, but man, uh, I, I got to scratch my head at some of the choices they made at the beginning of the season. Well, I, I am loath to admit that I did not finish the first season. I think I had maybe two episodes left, but but not knowing whether or not this was a one and done, never going anywhere thing. As I got closer to the end, I became more fearful of investing you know, my time is something that wasn't going to go anywhere. And then uh, now that, and then, then there was that middle period of like, Oh, there's going to be a second season. I should get around to watching those. And then it's like, I'll watch it when the second season comes out. And then the second season comes out and then it's like, well, let me find out if it's good. (laughs) And so, so as a result, like I'm glad to hear that it ends up somewhere. uh, But I, it sounds to me like, does it get a benefit from binging? I assume. Uh, You know, it, it, I would probably have stopped watching it if I had to watch every uh, if I had to wait a week between those first four episodes. Uh, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, you know, so it is benefited in that by the end of those first four, I was like, OK, well, maybe next episode things will start cooking. And then I did that three times, uh, uh, which if it weren't one of those like Friday night, we're just, you know, me and me and Ash are just sitting around like we're either watching TV or we're going to sleep. I probably would have uh, uh, made another decision, but uh, I stuck with it and, and and I'm glad I did because there is, there is some really, really fun, cool kind of like a uh, uh, science fiction and time travel uh, kind of uh, storytelling that they, that they like to do. And I think they're good at it. Uh, you know, when, when they're, when they're not, when uh, they're good. I yeah, yeah but it's I, not, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to spoil much. Andrew, did yeah? I think I remember you saying you watched it, right? Yeah, I watched it, and I and, and funny thing, Brian, I watched Future Man season one on your recommendation. How much you're enjoying it? Oh, I loved it. I, I loved it beyond you, words. So you're like, you're like, man, I'm gonna give up two episodes later. But uh, no, I, 
I dug, I dug, few, I, by the time I got to the end of the first season, I enjoyed it. There, yeah, there's strengths and weaknesses, but the strengths are so great. It was such a fun show. The second season, you know, um, I, I totally agree the pacing for this because it's sort of like, it's like, man, we're spending a lot of time in this storyline and I'm bored. I could, it, we could just move right along and it's not, and it feels like, it, it, it feels like, uh, you know, a, a, you know, the a writer's room that was heavily disorganized and filled with, you know, smoke. Um, and uh, <laughs> that there was a lot of cool ideas there that never got a lot of structure to them. And that's sort of the problem, because like on the surface, like, hey, cool, a Mad Max-esque thing and this sort of thing, which, you know, we, we got a little bit of that. But, you know, it's, I kind of feel like this is a show. This is a show that now kind of has to compete with Rick and Morty. You oh, know. yeah, 100 percent. In, in fact, there are there are moments in which. Uh, you, you think about like, okay, this is a time travel story that is definitely trying to seize on time travel tropes, right? And so yeah. Back to the Future and Terminator, uh, and you kind of realize like, oh, wow, you know, Rick and Morty can kind of just parachute into an episode and be like, yeah, here's, we're going to make fun of Inception, and then we're out, right? Yeah. Here's, we're going to make fun of, uh, uh, you know these kind of movies, or or this uh, kind of plot, and then we're out. Uh, and we can be very meta about it, and that's it. Whereas, like, to me, the 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 times that I found myself the most bored were either a when we were in plot lines that I just uh, it was like, okay, we get it, let's move it along, or when they were transparently just kind of stapling on some. Uh, uh, satire for the sake of it. Like, there's this is, you know, uh, you know, very minor spoiler. They have these like themes on top of episodes that are like about like a family sitcom or a very specific reference to a crime procedural. And it's like for no reason, like, literally, it's not like, I mean, I don't know, maybe people more familiar with, with the crime procedural would, would, you know, get. The, the subtleties more than just graphic cards, but I didn't think it was necessary for the story that I like. The story that I like has likable characters unraveling a crazy mystery while involving time travel. Like, get get to the that. I like the that part. Yeah, they just felt like, like I said, like, hey, these are some fun ideas that never kind of got strung together. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, it's like, uh, once everything is kind of there on display, I think there's some there's some good stuff there, and I've I, I really enjoy it. My favorite character of of the season is uh, 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 Haley Joel Osment, and his character is you know continues from the first season in a really fun and interesting way, and I I, I enjoyed his performance and the idea of of his character. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He's a delight wherever he shows up. And yeah. I, I, I and watch this. That you'll enjoy it. At the end of this, you'll be like, "Hey, I'm glad I watched this," and I'm looking forward to season three. Yeah, I, I you know, it was for, for the first time I, I was noticing at the end of episodes, they would end episodes uh, without a cliffhanger in the in the first half of the season. It would just be like, "Oh, here's a thing," and somebody you know uh, got to the end of this episode arc, and then they're gonna look onto the change that they made and that'll be the end of the episode. And it's like, wait, no, you're the, the whole thing is that they're stuck in a place and they need to be going to the, to the resolution. And by the end of the, the episode that I'm on now, it does what I think the first season did really effectively, which is like, all right, we're at the end of this. And now here's the little thread that gets you into this next episode of a mystery series. Cause at the end of it, it is a, a mystery series that they have to unravel how to how to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. So uh, I got a pick. I Go. uh, I went and saw that uh, that Glass movie, the new M Night Shyamalan. Did you, any you of you guys had see a it? Very a very complicated history with this. Uh, uh, I do have to ask if you went with your brother. I did. I did. Okay. Because yeah. that was, uh, for those of you who have not listened to Night Attack, uh, 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 Jay, who had a medical scare last year and was in a coma for a, like a, a significant period weeks, of time, think, yeah. 
one of the first things he said when he woke up was 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 has glass come out yet <laughs> and this is back over the summer <laughs> so i think both of us then we saw the reviews and both of us felt this like deep sense of obligation it's like well we don't not see glass together after after yeah. that right uh i gotta tell you uh so, so have any of you guys seen it no. i didn't see yeah. it no i think I, I as soon as i saw the 50th commercial and trailer where it was like a bunch of people running around outside the the sanitarium and i'm like this isn't what i liked about unbreakable and this is the stuff that i like the least about split uh i think that much like the movie solo and i'll never know in the other timeline what it looked like or felt like to see it in a vacuum right uh, in a bubble but um, I'm so glad that I heard all of the gripes everyone had about it going into it uh, or just just at what point they fell off, because I didn't really get any spoilers. But I, but, you know, like I heard that some people hated the whole thing. I heard that some people liked the first 75 percent of it or whatever. Um, but the biggest thing, like going into it with low expectations made me appreciate all the things that were delightful and the interesting touches uh, that they do. Um if you are unfamiliar, the biggest key to enjoying Glass is to remember, 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 it is a Blumhouse film. If you can not let go of that, if you can keep that at the forefront of your mind, uh, and remember that the way Blumhouse works is that you are given complete creative freedom, and you are told exactly how many dollars you get to spend and not one more unless you want to pull it out of your own pocket in which case good for you so you get a lot of scenes like um this set piece has a bunch of things that will do something very impressive if you try to cross me and then it's like oh, i'm gonna try to cross you cut to exterior shot with sound effect of something very impressive mutedly happening inside then back inside to what appear to be the effects of something really interesting happening, right? Or likewise, you know, a person says, I've got a plan that involves this massive visual set piece and I'm going to uh, enact it. And I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, this, is, this is a Blumhouse film. And it's like, if you, could, if you could hold on to that, I think you'll enjoy it a whole lot more. You know, uh, you know it's interesting is the... I'm I'm looking for it. I I I like Split. I was like I love Unbreakable. I, Split was fine, but it wasn't like ah. But you know this is a movie where the uh, the critics have 36 percent, but the audiences have given the 76 percent. So you're looking at like it's a very different sort of take, and that's you know that's why at first I'm like oh I'm sorry to see it didn't well. I'm like oh people like it. People really like it. So you know. Let me go check this out. I mean, you know, just, so just remember, it. Blumhouse, 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 and you're going to have a lot more fun. Uh, uh, although yeah. I, I, I do think uh, J.C. Calhoun does point out that a, that uh, M. Night, I think, works with Blumhouse as a uh, as as a distributor. But I think he mm -hmm. finances the movies or he has. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, he finances them now, out of now, pocket. Now, I think that uh, you wind up getting to the same point no matter what, which right. is that everyone's watching the bottom line. And no matter what this script is. It, it the, the the question for M Night is can he match his vision to his budget when it seems like he obviously had a very big vision for for this story. I will say uh, I don't think this is a spoiler, but but you know um, the uh, you know it's it's a, a, a sequel simultaneously to Unbreakable and Split. Um, it, it uses footage from both of those movies to flash back to, which uh, and uh, and and blends it with with story elements, which I thought really. Uh, you know, I don't know, was was interesting. It's wild to, uh, like, imagine the expense it would take to uh, have Bruce Willis remember something that happened, you know, 15 years ago, and then you'd have to digitally, you know, de-age him or whatever, but instead he's able to remember it 15 years ago, and they just use the footage from Unbreakable, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it ends up, like, the, that's one of the elements that, that, I, that I enjoyed. Again, you know, if you're thinking about it as a storytelling puzzle, and you're like, well, how are they going to not actually deliver on this, but instead tell a story. Um, you know, there's a part that, that fall flat, but there's other successes. Yeah, cool. Bryce? Uh, you know, I haven't been watching too much stuff uh, over the past week. I, I have been uh, uh, re-watching kind of in the background um, Shit's Creek. I think I talked about this on the Killies on Cord Killers, but 
uh, I I am just in love with Schitt's Creek. It's a uh, uh, a uh, sort of ensemble sitcom. Ooh, excuse me, an ensemble sitcom from uh, I think it's a CBC. I think it's a CBC original uh, about this rich family who, uh, after a uh, tax issue, ends up uh, you know uh, all of their their belongings uh, possessed by the government and they have to go and live in this uh, small town that they bought as a joke for uh, for the son's uh, birthday when he was a kid and so they all move and live in this motel in Schitt's Creek and uh, it's it's I think it's a fun kind of wholesome um, show honestly it's it you you actually see a lot of like character growth uh, for for the characters it they're not just like awful vapid people the way that like arrested development kind of handles rich people yeah or, or or although structurally it sounds like it's a similar space to Ar- arrested development but 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 just it, with it maybe more sincerity or uh, yeah i mean i i think um I, I think because arrested development gives such a strong image of what you do with rich people mm-hmm. in a storytelling thing um you look at Shit's creek and and feel like it's very different from that but it's also um i i also think it's probably a little more similar to just like a normal sitcom uh, story, right? You know, you kind of have a wacky adventure every week, and there are some long-running threads of, you know, boyfriends or girlfriends or or family things. But um, it's it's a very light and and legitimately funny show. Um, I, I I really dig it, and uh, there are like three seasons of it on Netflix, and they're still making making more up in Canada. So right on, yeah. It's a shit. So uh, how much? It, it, it seems like it uh, it draws comparisons to Arrested Development. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, where where is it different? Uh, uh, oh, I, 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 th- I think you were uh, oh, on yeah. an errand as, as he was just just talking about <laughs> oh, that. Sorry, oh, yeah. all right, my mistake. <laughs> it's then. I'll not, listen to the show. It's uh, it's it's sincere and and it it it. it uh, I think the one thing I really like I um about it in in kind of treating these sort of rich people as out of fish out of water archetypes is that um it it still finds ways to show them as skilled people. And not just like blundering, you know, cartoon rich characters, people. right? You know, yeah. you're like, okay, well, you know, you're definitely in a, a environment that you're not accustomed to around people that you probably wouldn't hang out with, but also you are able, you you still are like a valuable person. You're not like a complete wasteoid, um, uh, you know, trust fund person. So it's, it, it, I don't know, it feels very kind of humanizing in that way and it's just like heartwarming you know it's a very like family it's 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 it is a mature uh, uh comedy uh there's mature language and stuff but it's very like family uh heartwarming sort of tales cool yeah. andrew my pick is going to be a little odd um and it's one of the joys of like hulu and some of these other services you'll go through there and find shows or things like that that you uh forgot about or go like oh yeah let me go back and watch that and a lot of them don't don't hold up but sometimes you find there's a little charm to it and i i went back and i saw that hulu had sliders oh yeah how, how did it how does it age please say good. you know <laughs> the 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 thing about the show sliders is that you know you forget how much more expensive or how much more production quality goes into TV shows these days. You know, yeah. you know, you watch shows now, sci-fi shows, things like this, and you realize that, like, man, we special effects have gotten so much more, and the and the business of TV has gotten more that you can have because you know, Sliders was on Fox initially. You know, the first few seasons were on Fox when it was you know an up and coming but a network, and then it went to sci-fi. But I mean, it, it, and you look at this, you're like, man, like this show looks like a low budget show. Uh, but you know, the, the writing in it was actually pretty good. And, and it was funny as I watched the first episode and I saw the, the director was listed as like, uh, Andy Tennant. And I'm like, that looks familiar. I'm like, who's Andy Tennant? And then I'm like, oh, he directed a bunch of the Kaminsky method. Episodes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And, and then you go look at like some of the producers who worked on like sliders. It'd be like John Landis, I think, you know, was like showrunner or working on or producing for a while and some other people in there. So they do, you know, they had one episode where they show up in uh, an alternate reality where a meteor is about to hit the earth, right? And they kind of split up to do their own thing. And, and one of the stories, the the, the crying man, uh, uh, Cleavon Derrick's character, 
he goes off and finds some people who are just going to party. They're just going to party. And he goes to this party and he and people are just going kind of, you know, playing music, whatever, having fun, like we're going to die, whatever. And then there's a couple throwing the party and then he follows them upstairs and some people are playing Russian roulette. Oh, geez. You know, <laughs> you know? And, they're, and, and it's like and it's sort of like they kind of do this like, man, they're like kind of exploring some sort of dark themes there, you know, and and he grabs the wife, takes them with him to a church. So they're feeding people on the last days. It was just a night. The little morality sort of play kind of like I go like, like, man, there's there's some neat sort of thinking that went into this show. You know, they go into one where, you know, the earth is soviet taking over like we became you know you know a soviet satellite state and stuff and it gets you know a little bit into into the politics of that in a way that like oh this is this is very interesting this is very very post cold war soviet union breakup we'll talk about it this way but 10 years later you wouldn't see, you wouldn't be addressed the same way so anyhow i i've been enjoying it so I thought, you know, it was a neat way to go about themes and, you know, deal with the challenges of production limitations. I, you know, I find it, I've been, I've been very frustrated, like, like lately with sci-fi that is just way too preachy, way, way, way too preachy. Like Star Trek Discovery just sort of drove me, I, I don't mind preachy if you're really nailing it as far as your execution. Discovery kind of just drove me nuts. Now Orville, I kind of like, but kind of got a little bit like that, you know, like, you know, like, oh, how do you do money in our system? Our system's based on, you know, here we don't have money. We're based on reputation. And I'm like, man, did they just endorse the Chinese credit system? <laughs> you know, so anyhow, I digress. Sliders, a simpler time. Uh, I will, I will vouch, uh, man. I remember really digging the first two seasons, or the first season was the most freewheeling. When I realized, I, I was so pleased when I was like, oh, they're, they're not going to make any judgment they're just going to play with different worlds like they're not necessarily there to save every world just just take us on a tour of it and then gtfo yep. you know and uh and then they started setting up like you know nemesis whatever uh that, that that's where it ended up losing me but uh but but those early seasons man i love them a lot yeah yeah so there you go it's been weird oh All right. yeah break all right, yeah, we'll take a take a short couple minutes here. I'll stay here, Bryce, because I already took my break. <laughs> I had to, I had to use the back. Oh no, that that happens. Um, uh, Andrew, I don't know if there's anything we can do about your video. It sort of seemed to cut out like right about when we started. Yeah, that was super weird, man. Like it was, it was, it was, it was cooking right up, right through the pre-show, and then immediately started firing. I, I'm gonna go rail. And I have Spectrum here, and I'm gonna. I, I pay for again. I can't buy a higher level of service. I only have one provider here, so right. you know I'm, I can go. I'm yell at them again. You know I, I don't. I don't have a lot of choice. Oh so. sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I just because uh, I, uh, it's it's even worse than in in, in the past few weeks when we've had it so um you know uh any, anything you can do can help um but we can also cover for you know uh hey justin how was your weekend hey man uh pretty good yeah pretty good i i have to say i uh had a little bit of a organizational breakthrough on the uh too long in gestation history podcast. Oh yeah, uh, did uh, some pre planning for South by, mm. uh, which I think you were on an email trying to possibly secure some special guests. That's right, and we'll have to talk about that because I got that email, and it was clear conversations had happened since the last time I heard about South by. So. Uh, we'll, we'll likely not, but this was me trying to push things forward, okay. basically. Yeah. Like, you, I'm almost positive you know everything that is to be known uh, uh, in terms of trying to get them, unless you did not know about getting I knew them about them. I knew about them, but there were the, the time, the calendar looked weird. There was weird stuff on the calendar that I wasn't sure about. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll no, talk that about was me just totally, like inventing a schedule that uh, uh, we can then change or or slide around. I think we might actually need to slide around even looking at 
some of the options. But it was basically just me saying, hey, look, let's get the ball rolling and make sure that, you know, we we everybody's still on the same page. That the general idea that this is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, can you talk about your history podcast breakthrough? Do you want to yeah, say that? I uh, I'm working with this other person peripherally that uh, would be an editor for the show. Mm. And she has worked on a lot of these kinds of shows before. And I gave her a like script for episode one. That would be an hour long. And she's like, God damn, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah, there's this information overload and I don't quite know what we're doing and gave me some suggestions as to how to reorganize it and I kind of did that uh, uh, but kind of made a decision that I want to look at more half hour episodes as opposed to hour long episodes which is a little bit away from uh, away from some of the inspirations for the show Mm mm-hmm uh, in that most of the inspirations that I've had for the show are hour plus, right? Yeah. Uh, but this would be a little bit shorter, but I think it would give me an opportunity. And so basically what I did was just lay out, like, in eight episodes, what would I do? And I was able to, like, oh, okay, well, this is a lot clearer if I'm, like, I do this in this episode, and this is the takeaway, and I do this in this episode, and that's the takeaway. To be honest, something that's actually helped me a lot, or at least put – a bug in my head is the the <laughs> the the the, the uh, uh, much maligned by your Kickstarter sucks uh, oh, show uh, uh, the America's I don't know what the title they're going to settle on, but uh, mm-hmm. America's Next Top Podcaster that Brian Ibbett is doing. But we're a couple weeks into recording it now. Oh yeah, and nice. Uh, I'm I found myself between Scott and Nicole being the more critical judge mm. and so i've you want to live up to it up to the well i'm just like i you know look it's like man that's really good advice justin you should really listen to it <laughs> uh, uh you know or at least i found myself saying like man if i'm going to be telling these people you know uh uh you know what's the point why do i care what did i learn what was special about this like i should be thinking about that myself it's not just because I know their answer, like everybody's answer is, well, I just was having a good time. I liked it. It was good. I felt it was funny, and I was hoping our energy would be infectious. And, hey, look, sometimes that's the case. Uh, it's It's been the case. Uh, Dude, I just walked in. Are you talking about our one-star review? No. Oh. Oh, okay. I thought Completely you were... Completely <laughs> a different topic. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Wait, we got a one-star review? Oh, we finally got our right. first non-five-star review, and it was somebody... It, it, like, it just didn't land on for what? me. On Amazon? Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to. Good, like, my whole talk. point yeah, was, no, let's not now, shine right, a spotlight on it, and now here we are shining a spotlight on it. <laughs> hey, hey, hold on. That's here my fault. Go. No, <laughs> doggone it. One-star... <laughs> 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 Oh man! In myself. Uh, Close the tab, Justin. Close the tab. Yeah. <laughs> That's just something they find. Oh no! I mean, no how, no. how on earth? <laughs> oh, somebody stop! Who likes stop! Us. Oh, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I I I'm living the plot of Iron Man, uh, the, the song from Black Sabbath, where I went, to, I saw the the apocalyptic future, and I tried to warn everyone, and in doing so, caused the well, apocalypse. Oh uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, he's a TMS listener, so I guess he just likes the oh. the jury duty segments. Um. <laughs> anyway, yeah, whatever. One star review, GFY. <laughs> or on your one star review oh but uh you're, you're trying to keep uh uh keep good to all your uh oh oh your yeah i forgot what i was talking about um <laughs> uh yeah no i uh uh you know it's one of those things where, where you just want to make sure that like there is that best practice and to be honest it's something that i've always very much valued i think brian you're exceptionally good at this uh, uh, just looking at something mechanically, be it a YouTube episode or a, or a live show or something like that, and uh, you know, or or a business pitch on the floor of TwitchCon, and kind of 
<laughs> thinking mechanically like, all right, like what is, what's the hook? Like, like what is the, the mechanical, like, you know, in, in a pitch, what's the idea? What are you selling me beyond the product? Like, like what is, what is the thing that you're tapping into or in a YouTube series? Like, all right, well, what's the, someone's going to watch this. And then what do they take away? Is it gut bustingly? hilarious like and and at that point how are we making sure that we build to it so we can showcase and explode it at the, exactly the right time is it a tutorial like are someone is someone going to take something away is it a factoid like what is that one thing that i i, I think of it is um why do i care the, yeah the uh, uh i think of it is there's a biological thing that you're going to cause in somebody else whether it's a feeling of 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 awe or 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 joy or tangible uh, 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 skills or the fantasy of you know like uh, of of being you know oh my god I can do that or or uh, that was amazing and we're feeling it out uh, maybe this is something we could talk about on uh, on after things mm -hmm. but in Scam Nation we're beginning to figure out that it's like no 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 you know we got to have something in those first structurally in the first five to ten seconds that makes people say like. Oh, that yeah no I'll stick around for three minutes if I can if I can have that you know yeah like just just there's you you got to get straight to something early on with YouTube what what is the artistic thing that you guys were talking about his his history podcast uh, oh, oh got it oh, two, the, the 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 two things number one I I uh, uh, figured out that I want to reorganize the history podcast as not five hour long episodes but rather eight. 30 minute episodes because I was able to kind of segment everything in a way that I think I could, I started thinking in terms of like, all right, part of what I always, what is exciting when I talk about this to other people is that I think that there is a bearing on this election to our modern era and, and both with 2016 and beyond, right? that there are a lot of parallels to emerging mass media in 1960 that are emerging social media uh, and how we, you know, and, and whether or not these are direct analogs, like we can s at least understand them a little bit better and looking at like, well, how did people deal with this, right? Uh, so what I realized is that if I break it up into smaller things, then each episode can have a takeaway. Like, uh, and, and all of it can be about, you know, so the first episode can be about, Hey, Kennedy and Nixon were way more people <coughs> than we imagined them. Right. And they had a lot of similarities, uh, uh, you know, leading up to this in a way that many people looked at them as kind of identical, uh, uh, leading into this, which is odd because now we can't think of them any different, right? Like one is they are two totally opposite sides of of the coin and so whether or not you want to chalk that up to history or just our understanding there's that right and then the next one is uh about the mob and and we can get a little bit more in a way that i couldn't initially into like hey like look uh, the fbi never said that there was a thing called the mafia until like 1959 like and that was long after there were even congressional hearings singling out uh, uh, mob bosses that the FBI kind of hand waved away as being like, sure, there's guys doing things, but uh, uh, there's no international crime syndicate. syndicate. Yeah, uh, the uh, I, I'm I'm cautious to even ask for fear of sounding like I'm trying to give you even more homework. But are are you familiar? Have you listened to Business Wars that that podcast? No. So they uh, uh, they're they're short episodes, twenty two minutes to twenty eight minutes per episode, and they take one subject and they do between four and six episodes on each one, and yeah. um, uh, uh, they like uh, lately I've been getting into podcasts that 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 worship at the altar of of identical structure every single time, every yeah. single time. One of the things I love about Business Wars. Is that you never start with an ad you never start with anything uh you never start with anyone setting anything up you just it always begins with the phrase it's blank and you hear you hear crowd noise and we're at the grand opening of uh, walgreens and yeah. it's like so and so is super proud that he's but what he doesn't know orchestral music plays you know is like is that uh, competition is right around the corner from the last place you'd look 
And then and then it's like, you know, whatever. This episode's about Walgreens versus Purina dog food or whatever. Uh, and then, but 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 each one is kind of told from the perspective of whatever. So it's like already from what you're describing. Uh, if you were to adopt that structure, and I'm, I'm definitely not telling you to do that, but the Business Wars version would be all like, it's 19, it's it's 1959. Uh, uh, he's already decided he's not gonna run, and, and then and then they actually, it's all one dude, but he does all the voices and then and and does sound effects and everything. Yeah, it, it's funny because initially the episode did open up with a it's 19 something. Uh, uh, dude, but, it's, but it's it's a great I, I, it's a great not, thing to I've do. I've actually kind of gone away from that a little bit. To, uh, to begin with the takeaway, like to, to begin with the like the called like, shot where it's like 30 minutes from now, you'll understand why the mafia is the single biggest influencer of the latter half of the 20th century. Sure. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or just like, you know, uh, uh, initially it's just like, what is power and how long are you willing to wait for it? Here is the story of, you know, the, 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 the Kennedy family and then the like, Neville Longbottom of this story is Richard Nixon. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's, uh, I don't know. It, it felt good kind of like cracking it a little bit. And now I just need to continue to work on it. it it's, it, I'll tell you what, it, it's a very <laughs> fun process though, because it's a, it's a show that I, I am, I am trying to not be hard on myself because it has taken forever, but I'm realizing that it's a fairly ambitious show that I'm giving like eight percent of my time. Uh, if I can cut in here, Andrew, are you able to stop and start your audio for us? I I think because the okay, they, what? Oh, there's something. What the 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 feed was? I had tried to fix the thing, and because the feed is coming in so intermittently, it. it what about now? Uh, well, at least we have a, a pause face of you. <laughs> um, no, I have yeah. Botox, and this is how I look. <laughs> <laughs> so just, some at, people at just least... do the forehead. I, I opted for the now full face Brian. Botox. It's super good. Yeah, uh, at least if I have that thing there, I know that I'm at least getting something. I had done a thing, and it would sh it was showing me nothing because no new frames had come in. So you know, listen, when you live in a rural area like Burbank, California, <laughs> you know, you you just got to make do with what you have as far as internet connection. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, are we otherwise good to start? Yes, indeed. Uh, things, as always, Andrew? quick reminder that I have I have thirty minutes until my hard uh, hard temporary out. Not all the way out, but I got to run down and pick up the girls. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, if if you're good to go, then uh, huh? uh, take it away, Andrew. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Brian Brushwood. Ahoy! Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. So, um, man, we have anything to talk about. No, you know, self-starters launching anything. No big hits, big <laughs> wins. No number one all over all media at all. Nothing like that at all. So I'm going to talk about the future of Fusion. Can, 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 I, can I confess that that uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that that I took the longest of the three of us to figure out wh what you were teeing up? I was like, wait, uh, was there something super obvious to talk about that? Because uh, normally <laughs> and, then, and then I realized where, where this was headed. Yes, Brian. Yes, Brian. So uh, for those of you that live under a rock, under the sea, on another planet, um, in a galaxy far, far, far away, Mr. Justin Robert Young and Mr. Uh, Brian Brushwood, it is. Yes, yes, uh, Brushwood. Along with, uh, uh, who's, the, who's the real talent on the album? Oh, Stephen freaking Cogswell. Yeah, they, they put out a, a, a little album, the little gang put on a show. And uh, <clears throat> Hokey Smokes, number one on iTunes, number one on Amazon, um, number one in all, number one in, in like you know, uh, music on Amazon. And and I got to call Brian up, and I got to do that. Like, uh, uh, we got to do the little play, the whole like, hey, hey, Brian, what's going on? Oh, that was my favorite part. And, and so I I just tweeted something, and it was it was pretty late in the evening. I don't want to say it was like two in the morning or something, but but it was late enough that you could tell it was only because I had tweeted that you felt permission to call in the middle of the night, and the yeah. phone rings. And uh, and you didn't even say what like you knew that I would know. And it's like, 
Are you ready? You want me to start yeah, first, or do, or do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, and I was, and, and knowing exactly what you were setting up, I was like, I was like, I'll go first. Uh, <clears throat> hey, uh, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I have the uh, number one album on Amazon. Uh, okay, go. Uh, what category? Uh, <clears throat> albums. The category is albums on oh, Amazon. Oh, 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 what? What what category? Number one, and what category of albums, Brian? The category of albums, like of, of all the albums, <laughs> uh, which oh, of course, oh. all of that, that was that us. May refer to a conversation I may or may not have had with somebody at one point about <laughs> books when I hit number one for all books, and I had this because you know that you know that like it's easy you can game certain categories like oh I'm gonna do you know latin pottery you know whatever and be number one there like i got the number one on amazon and well in a small category that there had been no new books in three months but and so i had that when i hit number one with naturalist you know i, I was telling somebody who was one of these i go oh yeah number one on number one book right now they go what category <laughs> although although would it Books. have been more <laughs> impressive to maybe say fiction in all of fiction like uh, because it's so hard to wrap your mind around all books Whereas, like number one fiction, I could I could grok that. No, oh, dunk on the Bible. Books, it's all books. Yeah. <laughs> but dunk anyhow, on the Bible. Um, now the way the way these things work is that if you move a lot of things in a short period of time, you can be on on, on top of there. And 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 you know, uh, Brian and Justin are still moving, which is the fantastic part of the story. It's not like you know for an hour they got to the top of it. Uh, several days at the top of the charts, and we're a week later, and they're an Amazon Choice. They're the number one spoken word. Yeah, I believe on Amazon and iTunes. I haven't tracked that, but it's a wonderful success, and it shows you that it's your Amazon Choice right now, dude. It uh, it was a real blast. Um, I don't even know where to begin. If we're giving advice, if if somebody's listening to this podcast, they're like, oh, well, I want that too. What's the secret? Well, that's a great. Yeah, I want. I have a book coming out on February fifth, guys. I want that too. Uh, well, the uh, key is uh, get a time machine and start ten years ago. Okay. Uh, Wait, uh, you by did. The way, we are still the number two comedy album on iTunes. Oh, that's great. So a week after launch. Uh, uh, so, you know, on, on, on one hand, I think the biggest, uh, 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 thing is just having an audience that a is, is interested in you and, and interested in the work, which, uh, uh, that is the goal of everything, right? So that is, imagine that to be the, the, the concrete that you buy, that you build your store with. It, it is just something that, you know, look, it can be aided by you getting on a platform, but ultimately it is about the work. If you keep putting in the work and uh, people keep liking it, then they will keep coming back, except for the one guy who left a one-star review. Oh, on, oh I, I, I deeply on regret even informing you that was a thing. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. I'll let go of it immediately. Uh, uh, that being said, I think what we've done a good job with, and now what's interesting is that for Night Attack, it's almost the the show is almost as much about how high we can get uh, uh, the, the 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 thing up close to the the bell at the fair uh, as it is the work itself. You know, I think part of the success of All's Well was in part because look, we we did something with Stephen Cogswell, who's an amazing musician who has without pay and without desire for credit uh, uh just made us a song based on clips from the previous show and he's done so for three years and so like th there was an element of let's showcase this let, 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 let's let's get this out there let's make sure that a lot of other people get to listen to it and also that fans of the show get to just have on their phone in a way that's a lot easier than uh, uh, searching the internet and playing it off a web browser. And, and, uh, and I think like in that regard, uh, I, I think that's something that we didn't really think through is what a gift we're giving to curate a 40, 45 minute experience as you journey through all these. Cause it does matter to have it in a discrete package that it's like, now we're here, now we're moving on to this other thing. Uh, whereas, you know, like, Technically, it's all out there. It's all been out there as a series of singles that are available on, uh, uh, you know, on the on the website. But I don't know. Somehow, it matters to have it all as one package. Uh, but but then the other thing was 
just again this this like uh, uh uh hey we did it before we can do it again let's let's see how uh, uh what what happens when everybody buys this thing at the same time although this was by far i think the least organized we've ever done that uh uh we we have in the past said like all right everybody at 5 p.m. eastern time that's when you buy the album the the difference here was you know i i tweeted about it uh when it first went on sale on uh at midnight east coast on 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 monday night and then i woke up the next day and we were already doing about as good as we've ever done for a a previous album's release and so we we're just like okay well now now is the time that you go so everybody go now and it just continued to climb and climb and climb so uh justin you had talked about one of the uh, uh one of the most interesting aspects of doing the contender was that it allowed you guys to pull back the kimono and uh tell everyone exactly the numbers and all that stuff in that medium post and you were suggesting that that we had the opportunity to do the same thing again on this story well, you know, you, you, you think about what we have as an advantage and what we have as a disadvantage. And it's like what we we did this without a label, a PR team or any assistance within any of the platforms that we were selling it on, be it Amazon, iTunes, Google Play or Apple Music and Spotify, the, the two biggest streaming uh, services. Apparently, it's like CD Baby will... Uh, uh, offer like clips and and tracks that you know up for to, to pitch to some of these places to to try and uh, uh, you know see if they they want to promote it, but we got none of that. So, what advantages do we have? Well, we don't care if we tell the truth in a way that uh, a, a, a label might not want us to, because it would make things seem you know, uh, maybe less impressive than it would be. Like if we just tell you, Hey, we got to number three on all iTunes, the, the, the premier destination for not just online music pur purchasing, all music purchasing, you know, that this is it. If you want to buy it, you do it on iTunes. And if we tell you that we got to number three, that sounds awesome. If we tell you how many tracks or albums we had to sell to get to number three, unless that number is like five billion, something that just goes beyond your sense of what is real or attainable. If I give you an attainable number, and believe you me, if and when we tell you that number, it's going to seem pretty attainable. Uh, then it'll seem less important. But we don't really care. In fact, that that might that might benefit our brand as the the rye tricksters because we figured out the 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 glitch in in the matrix that we can now trigger well also i think that of all the albums we've done this is the least tricksy of all of it uh i mean the the trick i'm using air quotes there um was that we had a really compelling story of why we were doing this album and what's in it and why you average casual fan of either of our podcasts or twitter feeds or what have you should participate in you know doing something right this minute because time matters as much as as much as uh, you know it's clearly not about the money you know we priced it as low as as we we can uh but uh i don't know it felt it felt the less tricksy the least tricksy um it it felt uh i don't know like like we, we did we did a good album <laughs> so i want to kind of break things down first first step is have an audience and yeah. the size of the audience is not as important as people may think when it comes to the intensity of the audience. And particularly if you notice right now that All's Well, uh, we talked about this before, is listed as an Amazon choice. So it's got this little label at the top that says Amazon choice, which influences people to buy. And it's part of the algorithm. You know, there's an iTunes algorithm. There's an Amazon algorithm. Getting a bunch of people to go buy something is part of it. But then Amazon, Amazon no, has seen every particular scam you can imagine for people trying to game the system. 
you know, they know their entire farms out there of people that will go buy something. You can pay a thousand dollars and have somebody buy, you know, 500 copies of something all at once. And Amazon tries to adjust for that. They look to see are these real accounts that we haven't associated with bot farms before when the reviews come in? Amazon, you know, it got leaked that Amazon was actually looking at people's Facebook connections to see, hey, did this person that just, you know, left a five star review? Is it one of their best friends? Is it a family member? And so they do a lot of things to try to avoid, you know, the sleazy sort of thing. But, you know, what you guys did wasn't tricky. You have a large audience of fans. You got them excited about a thing you're doing. And then you said, hey, everybody, go buy my thing. It's the, the same as you know what Drake or Kanye does. There's no difference there. Like, hey, let's all let's all go buy it at once. And you price the strategy right. So there was nothing uh, deceptive about that, you know? No, so, but I mean, yeah. the, the only the only <laughs> deception uh, and it's not even a deception. Um the only thing tricksy about it is that um, we very nakedly shouted to the world that we cared about how well this did on day one. A Kanye uh, dare not say that he cares. He just has to, you know, quietly, secretly care and then, you know, act like it's well, NBD when it happens, you know, whereas I, we're like, oh, go ahead. I don't know. I mean, they they do big launch day pushes. It's obvious. It's clear. We're doing a big push. Everybody go out and get it. You know, this is the day that it hits because the same rules apply to them, apply to you. And, and you know, you want to get those. One, there are there are several goals you're trying to do. You know, like, like with books, the first thing I want to do is I want to be able to declare some sort of success. I want to yeah. be able to declare success. And one is, uh, you know, outside of the quality of the book and the reviews, and the reviews are super critical, but you want to be able to say, hey, number one techno thriller right now, or top 100 for thrillers. You know, those are things I want to say. Or top of a category, because that's the proof to other people that, oh, shoot, there's momentum here. It's not just this guy telling about their book. Same for you guys, is you want to be able to get that, you know, if you're, an, if you're an artist, a musical artist, you want to be able to say, hey, top album, top Billboard album, or top 10, mm -hmm. and you push a lot of intensity into a short period of time. Then you want sustainable growth. You want to keep it going. You want the momentum that comes from that. You want what happens when it used to be, well, I want, you know, the people who cover music to talk about the album. I want radio, you know, DJs to play my album, keep going that now what you're kind of doing is like, I want the algorithm to recognize this has value. And part of what comes through there is you can have a bunch of things get bought. Like you can scam a system and say, I'm going to have, you know, pay for 500 of my things to get bought and hit number one. But when the algorithm says, yeah, but anybody who bought that afterwards didn't like it mm -hmm. and you're not going to get recommended or pushed. You got an Amazon's choice because people kept buying it and liking it. And, and that's a critical part of it. And and sales and chart stuff is still something that like the high end of the the music industry is still sort of dealing with. There was a thing back in August uh, of 2018 where uh, uh, Nicki Minaj's new album had come out, and uh, the when it it didn't debut at number one, uh, it it had been found out that uh, I think was it Travis Scott uh, had been selling. Um, had been bundling album purchases with his merchandise. And so when people bought a shirt or a hat or a hoodie or anything, they would count that as an album sale. And so even even in, in these higher end, you know, high volume sales situations, people are still trying to get people to just even buy albums anymore because yep. it, because people are doing it so less. And it is, uh, you know, if you're if you're a Nicki Minaj and you put out your first album in however many years it was and you can't hit number one because X, Y or Z. You know, there is there is a uh, prestige to being able to get that number, especially today, especially when you're very bad. And, 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 and I hadn't realized how much just since we did the last album that the landscape had changed because of, of streams right. and, and them yeah. counting or half counting or or like none of us know what alchemy goes on behind the scenes as far as that goes. Yeah, there are weird things of like an album has to be streamed. Uh, like a hundred times all the way through or so something like that to be considered the same weight as one purchase. Hmm. They, they consider streams a fractional part, but then there's stuff like YouTube and music videos that, that feed into uh, different types of charts. There are, so is there still radio plays uh, that, that get factored in there? I, I wouldn't be surprised if things like Pandora, which are all sort of algorithmically focused uh, are also a different weight. All of that stuff is very, um, the little bits of information are, are, are very few and far between. Somebody mentioned the chair and said, I got a CD of the concert ticket purchase that count as a sale. It probably yep. does. Yeah. hundred percent. 
one of the things that happens too is you might hear about a politician or some celebrity just hit number one with a book. Uh, often what will happen is if you want to hire somebody to go speak for you, some you know famous person, they might say, oh, well, yeah, the, the price is $100,000, but we also give you 3,000 books. But those books, they try to count those books as, you know, that was a thing, a way of gaming that is, you know, I'll, I'll speak for you, but you've got to buy this many books for your institution. It's the way it's played all the way through. Now, as indies, your goal is one is hitting, hitting, hitting that number one spot is good. It is very good and it helps you. The algorithm chooses you. And if you have quality, and that's the thing, if the quality is not there, you will get punished. You will see your 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 recommendations fall, you know, fall to the floor. And I've heard people like, oh, well, I had all these recommendations and then it didn't sell. Like, yeah, your people didn't like your your content. The content sucked. Your your you know, everybody who bought it after the algorithm, you know, said buy it. Oh, we're chortling over something. So no, I, sorry, I, I just posted, I just I caught somebody I just off. yeah I just caught somebody in the chat ah. trying to pull a fast one and it says here's Minaj's merch arguments and then I squinted <laughs> and I looked at the link and I'm like that's a link to Andrew Maine's book I had the who's just trying to pull this I shenanigan had the wrong URL and... <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you uh, it, you know that's the there's there was Chris Anderson I think it was Chris Anderson wrote a book The Long Tail with Wired yep. magazine and. And it was it was a very optimistic view that in the future that, you know, the value for all sorts of things is going to be great. And, you know, there'll be so much money to be mined from content that's 10, 15 years old or older. And I, I may be totally maligning his argument. I apologize to him for that. The problem was is that it didn't account for the fact that uh, you're going to be even though, yeah, old, owning these rights to these things, the future may have some value. We're going to be creating so much more content that you're going to be competing with a lot of things. You know, I saw, I've watched, you talk about the industry changing, 2011 eBooks, I get in, I'm, I get in a great time to get into eBooks, build up a name for myself. And then every other uh, person who wanted to write or had skill realized, oh, wow, yeah, I can skip the publisher and I can do my own self-publishing eBooks. So I jumped on board after other people and I was one of these, ah, guys, I'm ready to show up at this party too. And they're like, okay. And then other people showed up and then other people showed up. And it changed dramatically. And, you know, I watched, you know, how much money a book can make every month. And then you watch it dramatically drop because there's so much more to choose from. And that becomes its its secondary sort of thing. There's how to drive the initial wave. Then there's how do you sustain it? How do you keep moving product? So how do you keep moving product? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We're, 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 we're really good at day one. I don't can know I, how great I, we are at day one hundred, but uh, well, uh, but then again, I don't I don't know if that. To be honest, I I think that there is a larger conversation of where we want the albums to kind of fit in with with the night attack ideal because theoretically they would be something that are they're great resume things, uh, they're great uh, uh, intros to like oh okay well let's see where we can go where now. We will have a more flowery introduction because we have a number one comedy album, right? Uh, but I don't know. I mean, uh, as you know, we, we haven't really done that in in the past, so uh, who knows what we'll do going forward? I, 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 I you, you, we, you've already articulated to me what it does, how you're doing this, and what works. And this is what we talked about: is you released All's Well. What happened to the other albums? Oh yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was that was that was a surreal moment to look at the top ten in comedy and to see that all five of our albums were fully half of the top ten in comedy uh, on either either iTunes or Amazon. I think it was iTunes, right? iTunes, yeah, yeah. I think wow. Amazon too, but but iTunes was the first one. So I would say that you got to wag the tail. All right, new, new Andrew, new book, and the wagging the tail comes from you put something new out. When when I had Naturalist come out. And I had, you know, wonderful promotions for my partners, Thomas and Mercer. They did a fantastic job. Book was really well received. I watched all of my other titles skyrocket in sales. Okay, I actually had, uh, you know, other books I'd written, you know, exceeded their advances, and I got payouts from them because of the drive of the naturalist to this. My own indie books that I had books that were, you know, eight, nine years, you know, six years old, seven years old that been out there. Sales were incredible because people would get to into this one book and go, oh, I want to read more. And the algorithm would say, I get I, I kid you not. I got an Amazon recommendation today uh, for uh, let me pull this up. I got to read this to you. Um, 
uh, recommendation. Amazon said, hey, here are some other books you might like, okay? Um, and, and I get a headline from Amazon, Angel Killer, a Jessica Blackwood novel, and more. Ha! We found some recommendations you might enjoy, and it's all the paperbacks. Angel Killer, Blackfall, Name of the Devil, chronologically. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is today, It's and it's because, probably because I pre-ordered one of my own books, um, and then all of a sudden I get the recommendations for that. So, that's the key is that keep creating, keep creating. Don't don't stuff the pipeline with crap and go and, uh, you know, we've all seen this. Justin working at the magic, Brian watching the magic industry. We make a lot of money off of something like oh, I'm going to do. I'm going to repeat this thing in two months and I'm not going to think this thing through. It's going to be kind of half baked. Then all of a sudden we've watched people derail their careers as creators because they try to shove too much stuff down the pipeline. The and beautiful thing all is all be thinking of the same person. I don't know. Actually, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if we are. Oh, there we go. We he, he's grabbing for the text. <laughs> so so what I would say is that you know that, that what you guys did is you you have other sources of income. You did the album when you had an idea. You didn't rush it. You put it out there. It did really well. People love it. And now the algorithm is saying, oh, yeah, buy this other stuff. Buy this other stuff. And so the, the long tail got wagged, and now you'll see that. And my advice to other people is, Put a thing out there. If it's not a big hit, don't worry. Keep putting stuff out there. I've I've had indie books that did okay. Then I had another thing came up that did great, and those indie books sold like crazy because people were hungry for more. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it is it is interesting. Like, because uh, you don't want to totally rely on kind of the the long tail idea, but but there is there is truth to it. Like, there is truth to the idea that like, hey, look, we're gonna make a bunch of money on these albums that we put out a while ago, and uh, uh, there is an argument to be made that, uh, you know, it was like it was six years since we put out an album. Uh, we had we had not put out an album in in six years uh, since Night Attack Three, so like that was certainly a long time off. But uh, uh, you know, gosh darn it! If if these other albums aren't uh, aren't aren't out there, oh no, maybe not six years. What is it? No, five years? Five years? A little less than five. Four years. or five years, yeah. yeah. Hey, fun fact: Guess who has the number? Speaking of long tails and ancillary markets, who has the number one book on Amazon in all of Italy right now? <laughs> what? <laughs> really? Yeah, they did. They just released Il Natalista. They promoted that. Oh, so, wow. How cool, Andrew. That's amazing. Yeah. So I because I just noticed a big spike because, you know, I, I study my sales religiously or whatever. Um, it's it's four stars, not the same. Well, it's it's 4.1 stars, not the 4.2 or 3 that I have in the American version, which well, I you suspect know, not I blame everything can translate perfectly to the Italian. Yeah. Don't make no. me, uh, you know, listen, if it goes down any further, I'm going to start repeating all the mean things that Andrew Maine has told me about Italians. <laughs> I love Italians. I love Italy. All right. Shut your mouth. Uh, but that's I'll tell you, that's a side thing, too, is you got to go look Kindle, the print. Nobody's buying the print copies there. Um, Bryce shows the, the print. That was like, Kindle. No, fine. Oh, that's Kindle. Italy. Can, yeah. Uh, Italy. Uh, Maybe this is the. Are we gonna fact check them live here on the air? <laughs> yeah, maybe this is because it's the Amazon doc, the U.S. store. I don't, okay. Yeah, no, yeah, that you got to go to uh, Amazon.it. Um, yeah, not a lot of the Italian editions sold through the American Amazon version, but uh, anyhow, um, then Bryce shows it and just shows that I just completely lied, thinking nobody in Italy will check. Uh, I've had, I have my, you know, my my agency Trident. One of the things they're great about is foreign markets, foreign market rights. And that's one of the things you think about. And, you know, we saw this in magic. We're often selling things overseas is a pain in the butt. But then you realize if you can sell things overseas, turns out the rest of the world is bigger than the United States. Little little fact. I kind of didn't realize that. But if you can figure out how to bring to those markets and do that, you know, but also you can look at in podcasting, you know, just ex- even here in the United States, expanding to everybody heard about this here. Who, what's another group of people that could hear about this? Yeah, uh, those were the most successful uh, magicians that would go to on their European tours were the ones that bothered to pay uh, someone to translate their lecture notes because otherwise, you know, people would, would, you know, just, you know, watch and be like, thanks, bye. Whereas if you had something to sell in their language, that made a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So audience any audience i will say this again and again start a mailing list i just did this for my girlfriend because she's got uh, a premiere for one of her short films 
And we finally started building her mailing list. And I'm like, where do you start? Everybody you've talked to, you know, and she and everybody you've, you've emailed before. We put in the list. Her response rate was fantastic. People are like, oh, great. So glad to see this, you know, start an email list. Even if you're right now thinking, yeah, maybe I want to do a podcast. Maybe at some point start the list now putting together that build, yep. build, build. <laughs> Florida man at example.com. I never saw that. That's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, uh, and Justin, you pushed the button on the night attack mailing list for promoting yeah. the album. Uh, uh, I guess we won't have any, we don't have any way to, to track those if they were conversions on those. I mean, we can trick track yeah. clicks and stuff like that, track but, clicks, uh, yeah. uh, in general, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, it is the only way that we know that has stood the test of time in the modern era that is beyond walled garden. It is beyond, you know, certainly about as far beyond algorithm as, it, as, as you're going to get, right? Depending on the platform that somebody's reading the email on. But, uh, you know, you're, you're able to just connect directly to everybody that signs up. That's... Uh, uh, you know what? 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 We thought that the internet would be a lot more like mailing lists, <laughs> and it didn't turn out like that. Uh, it, it turned out that the gatekeepers had other ideas and more restrictions and varying prices to reach the people on their platforms. But mailing lists, good old fashioned mailing lists, mm, just just right. Uh, hey, I I, I got to run. But uh, let me just uh, give my my pick, if we haven't discussed it already, is where I'm creeping up near the end of the second season uh, of the, there only are two seasons of it, but uh, the closer I get to the end, the more I'm really enjoying Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's on Hulu. It, um, first season uh, really makes efforts to be grounded and gets more fantastical in the second season, and uh, it's a bit of a bummer that... Uh, that uh, that there are going to be no more Dirk Gently's because I really enjoyed it. Well, this time around, uh, yeah, right. There's always going to be second time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. it. I, I mean, I assume there'll be a third and a fourth and a fifth. I mean, you know, it's one of those uh, evergreen uh, Douglas Adams ideas that I'm sure will just get remade again and again. I'm I'm sure at some point, given the popularity of Doctor Who, that they may like, you know full on do a lot of his some of his scripts and stuff that he did for that a oh, wild some of the unpublished ones are ones that they've done some i think it's like radio books or radio plays and stuff but i could see like you know that'd be kind of a i don't know i'm just saying like we live in a future yeah where like it's just you know content that's pr that keeps proving itself every time it comes up to bat has value uh and which by the way uh do you know what happened i think this weekend um it, no, 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 I don't know no. what happened. What is you think, the this weekend? number one highest grossing DC movie of all time now? Oh, what? Aquaman. Oh, yeah. Wow. Past the Dark Knight. Crazy. Wow. How do you feel, gentlemen? <laughs> Wait, sorry, I didn't hear. Well, say that again. I said, how do you feel? Oh, I, I'm I'm all in, man. I, I've been I've been all about Aquaman from 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 the jump, from the first dip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's Dark Knight is 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 great, but I also that was also kind of a still a, a colder time for for superhero movies, right? I mean, it it was uh, round yeah, as a, I, I as think a the big difference film, here but... is China, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes it sense. It was domestic too, was it? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, do, you, do you know, Andrew? What's that? Whether this was just domestic numbers or international? No, international. Not not no domestic. It's still behind like Wonder Woman and still behind like Batman versus Superman. Yeah, uh, and even uh, Suicide Squad domestic hasn't caught up with them yet. Um, really? But this is what's that? Really? That's that's yeah. crazy. That Suicide Squad shows you exactly how much goodwill DC squandered. To be honest with you, but uh, uh, internationally, I think yeah, China. Look, it, it, it's almost made for China. It doesn't involve anything. You know, all, all the good thing about having all the action happen beneath the waves is that there's no political issues that you're going to have to traverse because no one is really real. So you can all, all the audiences can cheer and the government doesn't care about it. Uh, but it's gigantic. It's visual. And, you know, people punch each other Two two hundred and ninety four million 294 million in China. Wow. That's strong. That's strong. Yeah. I mean. 
That would still be but pretty solid in it America. Is, it is worth a billion. Wow. Worldwide. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, when that shows you, it's like, you know, why are, why are our Hollywood entertainment, you know, uh, uh, anti-establishment types so willing to, in some cases, like... <laughs> You know, it's like I'm watching the Pacific Rim or something like this. It's like, I guess the Chinese one, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Well, anyhow, yeah. I digress. Uh, uh, hey, I got a pick. All right. What's your pick? I watched the Hulu Fire Festival documentary, Fire Fraud. Mm. How'd you like it? Andrew, have you seen either of these yet? I watched the Netflix one. The the Netflix one. What What, what did you think? Um, let me, I, I enjoyed it. Here is my issue with the Netflix one. And again, I enjoyed it. I recommend it is when you get to the end of it and you, you find, uh, uh, McFarland, you know, he gets to jail and all this. They do a great job. The woman who had the restaurant in the Bahamas, they do a yeah. great job of this. You, you, you know, you, cause it's this funny, we're laughing. And then you realize, man, these Bahamians got screwed over. You know, these yeah. people got screwed over and we're laughing that these influencers are paying all this money to go to this douche, douche event, douche this and becomes a joke. But then you forget like, Hey, and they do a job of illustrating like these people got, he showed up to work on this thing. There's, you've been to the islands. There's often not a lot of opportunities. And you know, here they get screwed over again. And this woman who thankfully there was the GoFundMe, which is, you know, given her, you know, helped her and, you, and the, the kindness of, you fire fraud fire shows you the the wor- worst things of the internet but then the aftermath of seeing other people go no we feel for this woman the best things of it um my issue with it is we got a minor part of hey there was another group of victims there and the reason he went to jail wasn't because of the people who showed up and were given you know bread and cheese it was because he defrauded 27 million dollars and that yeah. was not really you you're left it, not that they they did this intentionally, whatever, but you could walk away this from the impression that he went to jail because they sold tickets to a thing that was a that they had to cancel. He went to jail because there are people who spent millions of dollars helping fund his ventures that got screwed over and got lied to, and we don't do enough to understand who are those people. And, and some of these, you know, you get some of these people who went had lawsuits like, ah, oh, I showed up and it sucked, and I sued, and I I got a big judge. I'm like, good for you. I've gone through worse and got nothing for it, but happy for you. Let's talk about, you know, the Bahamians were the real victims, in my opinion. And then, you know, you're like, oh, well, somebody has millions to spend. Who cares? I'm like, I care. I care. And that's fraud. And so I'd like to have seen more of that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, ICU says that I saw the Hulu one. Not sure if I need or want to watch the Netflix one. I thought that was the best part of the Netflix one because I think the Hulu one uh, uh, skips largely over. Uh, uh, at least painting as vivid of a portrait as the Netflix one does of exactly how invested the, the, you know, the, the Island of great Exuma was and how much of a, uh, of, of a, of a pressure they put on them for like weeks to work, just like everybody on the Island working as long as they physically could to get it in the shape that you see it by the end of it. Uh, uh, I think that's something that, the, the the Hulu one I think has they are both worth it. I, I I very much enjoyed both. They focus on different things, and ultimately I think they both have fairly glaring blind spots. That uh, Andrew identified the one that either tackles, which is, I mean, the Hulu one tackles it a little bit more. They but talk about the the app and the Comcast like venture capital stuff, which. I think was a significant part of his his charges, his fraud charges. Is that right? Because he was. Well, I, I don't. I don't know if Comcast ever invested. I think they pulled out. Oh, but no, they, yeah. no. They 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 offered a term sheet that yeah. the people working at the Fire app thought was a done deal, and then realized later that it was not a done deal. Uh, but no, it, it, it's about the the venture funds that that dude got, and and how many loans he took out, and and what he, uh, uh you know, how he out and out lied. I mean, look. Billy McFarlane is a con artist. And if that's the case, I don't know how the more preachy version of that doc, which is the Hulu one, can justify giving him a quarter million dollars to sit down for that interview. Uh, that's that that to me, considering what they wound up getting out of him, it's like you're 
to me, that perpetuates yet another, or, or, or even not to wear it on their sleeves. It's like, that's something that came out afterward mm -hmm. as, as opposed to saying like, all right, look now as we're lecturing the, the millennial generation of FOMO and then how that ties into all of societal's ills from uh, student debt to Trump's election. Let's also point out that we're marks too, that just, dropped a quarter million dollars to have this con artist lie to our cameras for three hours in his weird space pants. And by the way, how short is he? Because his heels are massive. They, yeah, like, they, they don't get, they, some of those angles are, are not super flattering to his height. Um, I, I, I do think there is some value. Uh, it's one thing to say, you know, okay, this person is a liar. This person told me this and did these things. But I think there is a, a weird intangible uh, quality to like seeing a person give you a canned lie or a, you know, a, uh, a, uh, a no comment or a dismissal. Like, I, I, well, I'm not going to really be talking about that. Oh, I, I think it's a better documentary for him being in it. Mm -hmm. However, considering the documentary is uh, leveling judgment at people that knowing what they knew at the time maybe should have said something maybe should have pulled out maybe should have alerted other people maybe should have done it louder mm -hmm. to then be telling that story and still giving that guy a like significant amount of money is is a little well, know. you know there's 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 a there's a scene in the Netflix one where you see a guy briefly identified uh and Angela Rafaro, whatever, who's Chuck Schumer's press secretary, right? Yeah. The guy who handles the current press secretary for Chuck Schumer, he's there talking to McFarlane after this thing, after McFarlane's facing federal charges and all this. And you're like, well, what's going on here? Like, why is this guy here? Was he conned here? What's the deal? Because, you know, McFarlane's in the middle of trying to launch and other and documentaries can be misleading, but like trying to launch, you know, his, his newest scam on people. And here's a guy and like, it's like, this is fascinating, like because we don't we don't get into McFarland's inner sort of circle or how he was able to pull people in, but clearly he's getting people to show up and he's getting people. You know, I I have a story at some point I'll talk about. You know, um, I met through an event years ago, a uh, husband and wife couple, and they're very wealthy, very interesting, very weird about where they made their money, and it turned out the 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 the, the guy was a funneler for Bernie Madoff. Oh wow! Yeah. You know, and it was just like, and it was years later because I always kind of checked for this guy's name in the headlines, and it came out he was a guy that was one of the big people who would get you know bring in wealthy people to Madoff, and like that's one of the things you find out with some of these con people is how does he get twenty seven million dollars? He knows people, but he also gets introductions, and we saw a little of that beginning where he wants to meet Jaw Rule. Oh, I paid this guy five hundred dollars, and I paid this guy a thousand bucks, and now I get to meet Jaw Rule, and it becomes the story of this. But it's like there's a story of like. Was he paying people for introductions to other people? And I mean, there's so much more going on here. Mm -hmm. that... Yeah, uh, I, I think that that was an element that that was missing from both. I and this is, I think, something Andrew and I, I know, have talked about this a lot about documentaries that at, at, at times I'm always wary about documentaries that present that like act like and here's why this happens. Like, I'm not fully convinced that the fire festival, although the tools in which they used were social media and Instagram, that it's necessarily a parable about millennials. I, I think that it involved millennials, right? But the, the story here is that a con artist found a soft spot in society where he could promise everybody all the money in the world. So he got the top talent to do the top talent and he got them so far into the process that governments, vendors, talent, everybody that was going there, nobody had a reason to say, even as it's very clear the emperor has no clothes, and I think a lot of us have been in these situations, you get so far deep into it that you're like, look, I can either keep going and hope that there is just a squirt of money at the end of this, that can make my time that I've already justified worth it, or I can walk away now and know for sure that I'm not getting jack. 
because mm -hmm. this is bad. Uh, well, and and, and uh -huh. that that to me is universal. We've seen those those situations happen uh, 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 in various different clothing. And I, I don't and this is my, my issue with the Hulu one was I think it tried to drive that home even further that this is something that is unique to millennials. This is unique to the social media generation. This is unique to the the element of FOMO that has been created by looking at cool people doing cool things on Instagram. And right. I can see where you come to that conclusion. I don't know if I if I bought it for the justification of, of all that, nor do by the end of it did I think it was the most interesting part of the fire debacle. Like Billy McFarland being a carn artist is the most uh, interesting part about that whole debacle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. I, I could see, you know, this being a, a similar thing with older people and, you know, going to go see the Kentucky Derby and, uh, you know, that we've, we've had versions of this, you know, and did, you know, anybody really know what the players club was? Did anybody really know? Did we ever look yeah. into this? No. Uh, no, I, I, I kid, but uh, yeah, there's, there's, this is our version of it, but it was interesting to see that like, yeah, wire transfer $250,000 to Kendall Jenner, boom, out goes your thing. And you're, you know, and it was, there was a brilliant strategy there, you know, hiring the top models in the world to go do your photo shoot. And we've talked about, you know, one of the ways that you, you launch an event is you got to have a big event before the event. If you want to do a big Kickstarter, you need to do a pre-launch before your Kickstarter and not have the first time people hear about it is day one you asking for money. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of parallels to that in other events. It's why they do premiere parties. It's why tell them, tell them something's coming. You know, they did this big high profile photo shoot, video shoot where they brought in the top models in the world and then paid them to tweet out fire festival, fire festival. So everybody who wants to be like them, Oh yeah, I look, I think that as a promoter, sure. But the secret to his promotion was and and look, I don't want to take away the fact that once he had all the money in the world that he didn't do interesting cool things with all the money in the world, but this was the story of this was how to turn a billion dollars into half a million dollars. Oh, sure. Right? Sure, I agree. I mean, that's why I said I wanted to see more about the, you know, the the people that got the 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 27 million or so that he defrauded. That was yeah. to me is like the you know, the the tragedy of the locals just getting screwed over. And then, you know, the, the reason he went to jail is, you know, $27 million was given to him. And like, well, how was this done? How do you, not that I want to know precisely how to do it for my own purposes, but. Uh, yeah. That being said, uh, I, I, I think that they are tremendous companion pieces. I, I, I liked them both for different reasons. I think that the, the Hulu one does a better job of giving a bigger overview specifically of the stuff that you're talking about, Andrew, and that going into like, where does this guy get his money? Who is he getting mm -hmm. to give his money? Uh, where is he in the hierarchy of venture capitalists? Like, where is he in the hierarchy of New York? Uh, 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 how does he find these people? Whereas the Netflix one, which again, it's got its own cardinal sin in that it's everybody that pushed send on all those Instagrams uh, uh, are, are the people that made the Netflix one. But the video they get and the fact that they, because they worked internally with everybody, they know all the stories. They know the most interesting stories that you're going to tell. And the I will repeat, nothing in either documentary is as good as the Netflix one where the uh, 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 one of the business associates talks about trying to go get their water supply from the, bah the the Bahamanian government uh, and what he's willing to do <laughs> to, to get it. That's that, that's documentary gold, if you can get somebody to say that on camera in that plain of language. Uh, but it, it's, it's look, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I quite understood where they wanted to connect those dots in, in, in the Hulu version. And it, it very much left a bad, at least... The fact that they weren't self-aware to say, you know, when, when they have people on camera that are like, Billy will be back. Billy will be back. He'll find a way to get money again. He'll find a way to get money again. You need, I, I like, if you're going to be that preachy of a documentary, you have to say we gave Billy a, a quarter million dollars to sit here. Like, yep. that's how we did it. He did yep. it to you. You're the marks. <laughs> yeah, I think that's. You know, that's part of it is just that you you can't 
comment on something that you feel either in you pretend that you're a part it's separate from it when you're part of it you know uh you know and it was it was interesting the netflix one was you watched him when he's doing this, this the latest scam like new york vip access and he's got a guy in there you know dialing he has still has the mailing list you know of all these people that have spent money before <laughs> which by the way on... good reminder mailing list so valuable yep. so so valuable, so valuable. <laughs> Yeah, that, absolutely, and that because he has a list of these people that were marks before that was spent thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. He gets a guy, they send him. He's like, send him two emails, or like you know, send him an email, and then we'll call him, call him twice. They don't pick up first. Everybody picks up the second, and he knows this is a scammer operating. He's like, get him on the phone, tell him he got the tickets, and it's just you're you're like, you hear about you know one of the problems. Uh oh. Oh, or Skype scammers in jail that figure out, you know, a lot of credit card scams, a lot of these things are run from guys who are doing time for fraud, who are in jail, got free time, got access to a phone, run these things. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it. fire fraud, uh, uh, check it out. Really, the only hero in both those documentaries is the same guy that gets interviewed for both that ran the fire fraud Twitter account. Uh, 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 he is a, 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 a smug New York finance guy that only in this story comes off as the hero. <laughs> like he would, you get the sense that in, in, in the real world, he would, he would be somebody that you'd be like, ah, oh, this guy, but here amongst these sewer rats and fakers, you're like, finally, a uh, weird finance Batman. You uh, <laughs> you you get uh, the strong sense that like, like that. I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that uh, blank fraud, uh, fire fraud is not the only something fraud uh, Twitter account that that he's uh, he's opened. Turns out if you if you open a hundred of those and call everything a fraud, one of those are sweet sweet pay dirt. It's like I don't know what you do for work, but apparently you just flew down to the Bahamas to prove your Twitter hunch right, <laughs> and also like he had friends on the Comcast uh, board that right. it could be like, hey, I just do me a favor. Don't give this guy money until after the festival happens. Like, he's, I don't know. He was very connected, but yet in this story, he is unquestionably our only our only he, child uh, saying the emperor has no clothes. Yeah, and the Netflix one, that, I'm like, what's the angle here? Like, you're, you're charting a plane to go, like, there's there's more here, and I'm I'm distrustful that I don't get more of why you are doing this. And I guess maybe it's more to talk about in the Hulu, but I mean, that's, you know, uh, you know, it, it's frustrating, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and look, he gives different stories to, to Hulu. He, he gives different, like he has different lines of influence uh, uh, there. So I have no idea who he is. I have no idea what he's doing. Uh, and and it is only in this world in which I'm like, hooray! I'm glad you exist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any uh, any other picks here? Mm, no, I, I I really haven't been watching uh, much stuff over the past week, so I, I don't have any new picks. Great. <laughs> good. We're all good. We're all nice. good. Watch both of the fire uh, documentaries. I, w I would recommend both of them. It is it is a wild story, and I think that they are divergent enough that you get a fuller picture in watching both. And I think watch it for that purpose, too, because it's, you know, documentaries I enjoy, and we're getting, we're in a new age of new documentaries, and, you know, we're getting a lot of them, And but when you get two of them on the same topic, it can be helpful because you realize, man, there's a lot of different ways to tell this story, and I'm curious to see their take on it because you know we you notice they leave out things that you go like oh i have a different i have a slightly different opinion here watching this other one than i did on the the first one mm -hmm. so yeah cool we all good yep it's been after Groovy. <laughs> i gotta run all right see ya all right bye thank, bye. thank you everybody for the show we'll be back in a little bit for Cord killers, Justin. You're gonna do jury jury in a bit. Uh, actually, Ooh. there will be no live jury today because uh, there is already a episode up in the feeds. Uh, we did a nice little uh, 45 to 50 minute sit down with myself, John Teasdale, my co-creator on Contender in Action News, and. 
our new partners at Golden Bell, uh, w- who we are now in partnership with on the Contender and Action News. We talked about why this was uh, why this was a good deal, uh, uh, what it's going to mean for fans of both of those games, and a little bit inside the world. If if you are interested in after things and you want to get a little peek inside the world of the tabletop community and and what it looks like with distributors and how you go from an idea to selling it, how you make that as a, a, a success, what industry norms are and why we ultimately decided to go with Golden Bell, then go ahead and check it out. There you go. Awesome. Well, we'll be back with Court Killers in a bit tomorrow. We're going to have a, a, a Jack AM's Kate Raft on Night Attack. That's going to be a lot of fun. She's, she's great. Uh, every time I see her, I've been watching the Jack AM a little bit more in the mornings. And uh, that's a, that's a funny show. It's a brave, bold yeah, thing no, you do, getting up great. in the mornings. Well, okay. I mean, I mean, I mean, <laughs> like, like better, better, than, better than us. Like, it's a noble thing. Uh, well, and it's it, you know, it's like nine a.m. when they stream. Still, or still but, courageous in okay. my book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have a good, uh, have a good one, people. We'll see you later. See you.